Second Homes by Grant Eustace, starring Peter Egan as Stamford Holmes and Jeremy Nicholas as Dr. Watson. Episode 1, The Case of the Grandfather's Client. The way you treat your digestive system, Holmes, it's a wonder you haven't done yourself some serious damage. Watson, while I'm only too pleased when you call here so early in the morning, I would be grateful if I could finish eating before you begin to scold me. You're such a trial to us. Your family doesn't deserve the friendship of doctors. Your grandfather, with that insidious drug-taking of his, your father with his smoking almost every waking minute... Well, still he managed to cough on into his mid-seventies. Yeah, and then you... For weeks you live on nothing but coffee, which one of these fine days will give you palpitations of the heart. Oh, no. I mean, yeah, and, and then suddenly you go to the opposite extreme, sitting down to a breakfast that could feed four people. Oh, I'm sorry. Do help yourself to toast. Yes, thank you. Yeah, well, goodness knows how much cholesterol in it. I despair of you. I really do. I might be forgiven for the same reaction about you. You're always telling me to apply myself more, but you appear to have forgotten that when I have no project to engage my mind, I have very little enthusiasm for food. When my interest is aroused, however, my appetite returns, so I indulge it. And then you tell me off. It really is most unreasonable of you. Ah, oh, a project, eh? I knew it. The Samuelson diamonds. What about them? You've been called in to help recover them. What can I do that can't be done by all the resources available to Scotland Yard? After all, all they have to do is to find a naturalised Hungarian with the top of his left index finger missing. Hungarian? There's been nothing about that in the reports. I know, it takes them a little time, but they'll work it out. They don't need any help from me. So, this is some new case that hasn't reached the papers yet. Oh, no, it's in all the papers. It's the excavation of the Roman remains down by the river. Remains? It seems mm. to confirm what I've always believed, mm. that the name Garlic Hythe, far from being a place where garlic was unloaded and sold, mm. is really a corruption of Grolictus, meaning raised on gralli or stilts, so that... I don't believe it. Oh, that's certainly what Grolictus means. Holmes, every time my back is turned, you're off on some new tack. Two months ago, it was all hang gliding. A month ago, you were building a satellite receiver. And now it's archaeology. It's philology, actually. It's not good enough. Do you think your grandfather went to the trouble, late in life, of establishing the Holmes line for you to neglect your calling? Establish the Holmes line? You make my family sound like a railway. Oh. My dear Watson, you must be by now the only person in the world who believes that the profession of consulting detective is not a dead one. Not at all. What about all these people who write to you every day? They are the least successful in our society, Watson, who approach me merely to boost their low morale. A young lady wants to locate a young man so she can bring about a paternity suit. An old lady wishes to recover a missing poodle, and so it goes on. They want a lost property office, not me. Just a minute, Holmes. Before you throw them away, did I recognise the crest on the back of that envelope? I doubt it. Let me see. Oh, very well. Mm. Postmark Devon. A boar's head. Great Scott, Holmes, this is the Baskerville crest. Don't tell me Sir Henry Baskerville has written to you. He would need a means more supernatural than the post office. He would be comfortably over 120 by now. Ah, his son, of course. I may read this, mayn't I? Anything to stop you complaining about my drinking coffee? Hmm. Let's see. My dear Holmes, you might be forgiven for believing this letter to be the ramblings of an old man. <laughs> Now, indeed, I would not have written but for the insistence of my nephew, Michael. Nephew, eh? Hmm. Basically, the problem is this. A couple of weeks ago, a sheep was found dead. Oh, dear. It had been, ba mm, it had been badly savaged around the throat. Good Lord. I wonder what could have done that. Oh, careful now, Watson. Don't jump to conclusions. Oh, no, 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 of course. The throat. Two or three times in the last week, there have been strange noises at night. Holmes, I knew it! These noises sound like an animal, but like no animal you have ever heard. The Baskerville name is associated with that ridiculous curse. Holmes, it is! It's the hound. Oh, Watson, how could it be the hound? My grandfather emptied a revolver into it, and I understand he was a moderately accurate shot. Well, it's obviously that hound's dead. Well, that was a put-up job anyway. Hmm. The legend says... Good heavens, Holmes... There might, after all, be a spectral hound loose on Dartmoor. Oh, Watson, really? How can a down-to-earth medical man make such a statement? There are stranger things in heaven and earth, Holmes, than any... That says maybe. But where has this hound got its sense of timing from? Why should it lie low for three centuries and then appear just at this moment? Ah, so you're saying this is another attempt to use the legend as a cover for some evil purpose. 
No. Oh. But I will say it's a trivial matter we need consider no longer. Read the rest of Sir George's letter. Mm. Let's see. There is probably some simple explanation. <laughs> but there are superstitious lot down here, and this thing might get out of hand. Hmm. But I leave it to you to decide if you can spare the time to look into... Well, of course you will. Nothing is further from my mind. But, Holmes, think of your reputation. What if something were to happen to Sir George and you weren't there? Watson, Sir George is 79. Am I supposed to prevent nature taking its course? Do you know what I mean? In the event of foul play... <laughs> There's no suggestion of that. So you intend to refuse this cry for help from a frail old man? If he's old and frail, he needs a nurse, not a detective. I'm well qualified for both. I shall go down. Mm. How is it that your practice allows you so much time away? Ah, that's the beauty of these health centres. <laughs> With four GPs in one building, getting away for a few days is hardly ever a problem. I hope your patients share your view. Now, this is your last chance, Holmes. Are you coming down to Devon with me? <sighs> well, I suppose I could see if there's any philological research I can ah, do. Capital! I'll ring and say we're on our way. <laughs> Holmes? Holmes? Yes? You awake? No, I talk in my sleep. Were there already? No, just past Swindon. Well done. Hmm. What is it? Two things. First, your copy of Who's Who had all the facts about Sir George. Yes. His service in the Second World War, a Lord Lieutenant and so on, mm -hmm. and his marriage. Seems his wife died some years ago, but there was no mention of any children. So you assume there aren't any? Oh, yes. Didn't you see? We have the same pattern re-emerging. A problem of who inherits from a childless Baskerville. The problem in the first Baskerville case was the disposal of a fit 30-year-old man in order to inherit. Whoever is due to inherit on this occasion only needs a little patience. Wait, we when we get there. Mm. But the world needs looking into, don't you think? If you say so. Now, the second thing. Oh. When I rang Baskerville Hall, a woman answered the phone. Sir George said later her name is Mrs. Garcia. And? Well, that's not a very British name, is it? Not very. Spanish extraction, would you say? A reasonable deduction. There you are. There's a pattern again. In the first case, there was just such a woman, too, from Costa Rica. Watson, if you're going to spend the entire time looking for parallels with that occasion, I shall get out now and return to London by train. I advise against that, Holmes. Why? The train drivers are on strike. Oh, so they are. Then I shall go back to sleep. If we got in my car, we'd have been there by now. Hmm. I would have had a coronary. The way you drive that Ferrari takes years off my life. Far be it from me to criticise your grandfather, but I think he has a lot to answer for, leaving you all that money. Do you? Well, think about your Baskerville parallels instead, and consider this. The original hound was to attack its prey at night on the moor. Mm -hmm. Do you honestly see a 79-year-old man taking nocturnal walks? Well... Mind if we stop for a second, Holmes? What for? Well... This is quite a moment. Our arrival on the moor. I've, uh, I've never been here before, as it happens. Except in spirit. <laughs> so, of course. What was it my grandfather wrote about it? I'm sure you'll remember it. <laughs> when you are once out upon its bosom, you have left all traces of modern England behind you. <laughs> he knew what he was about, eh, Holmes? It's still the same today. What was that? Just a trace of modern England, Watson. Right behind you. In fact, a coach full of Japanese tourists. The driver seems to think you're blocking the road. Ja ja Japanese tourists? There's nothing sacred. Watson, if you keep stopping like this, we'll never get there. Oh, just once more. After all, it's our first sight of Baskerville Hall. Come on, Holmes. Oh, at least we won't find tourists here. They'd have too much sense. Oh. Ah, this really is wild country. Just us and the hall. Did you hear that, Holmes? That was a shot. From a 7.62 self-loading rifle, unless I'm very much mistaken. 
Holmes, we must get to the hall. Why, no one's shooting at us, are they? What if it's an attempt on Sir George's life? Ah, the hound's been trained to use a rifle, is it? Holmes, do you hear that? Hmm. Good Lord, where did that come from? Not bad flying for this terrain. Can't be more than 50 feet from the ground. Holmes, look over there. Excuse me, gentlemen. But in case you're not aware of it, you're right on the edge of a military exercise area. Oh, good Lord. Keep on the road, or to the right of it, if you would. Yes, of course. Don't stray over that side. Thank you so much. We're very sorry. Any more nostalgic stops you wish to make before we get to the hall, Watson? Times may have changed, Holmes, but the mystery remains. Why did we receive that letter from Sir George? Because he posted it to us. <laughs> Welcome to Baskerville Hall, gentlemen. Ah, it's Mrs. Garcia, isn't it? That's right. Please come in. Oh, I say, look at that, Holmes. It's just as I imagined it. The window of stained glass, the stag's heads, the oak panelling. The radiators. Well, you, you must expect a few concessions to progress, I suppose. If you would wait here for a moment, I'll tell Sir George you've arrived. I wonder, could we wait... In the dining room? If you want to, of course. <laughs> Through here. Thank you. There, you see, Holmes, definitely foreign. And certainly some Spanish blood. Yeah, what did I say? But also a strong strain of Igorot Indian. What? So, the lady is from the Philippines. Good heavens, is she really? Ah, there are the family portraits. Must have a closer look. Oh, it's fascinating, eh, Holmes? A poor second to Roman remains, I'm afraid. Good afternoon, Dr. Watson. Uh, no, I am Stanford Holmes. That's Dr. Watson. I'm sorry, I naturally thought... Of course, uh, it's a slight affectation Watson has, using that large magnifying glass. Sir George, delighted to meet you. Let's go across to the library. Mrs. Garcia will want to lay up for dinner in here. I can't tell you much more than I put in the letter. Uh, We've heard the noises once more since then. The noises? Are they... Uh, I mean, it, it is within the bounds of possibility that that they come from a hound. Yes, in theory, yes, but mm. in practice, it would mean subscribing to the legend of the curse. <laughs> No grown man could do that. <laughs> <laughs> Quite. No grown man could do that. Why? Well, well, have you any other explanation? It's a trick of sound, I'm sure. Only hear it at night, you see. Only at night? And no one's seen any tracks or even seen an animal? No. When the sounds are heard, where do they come from? Oh, good heavens, of course. They come from the Grimpen Mire, don't they? It's difficult to say exactly where at night, but it's it's on that side of the house. We'd better go and see the infamous Grimpen Mire. The Mire's not what it was. We've drained and cultivated a lot of it. Oh. I think there was a question you wanted to ask about a will, Watson. Uh, oh, yes, good gracious, yes, I, I nearly forgot. Uh, I appreciate this might be a little sensitive, Sir George. You mean, what happens when I go? I didn't want to put it quite that way. <laughs> it's just your doctor's bedside manner. <laughs> it's all signed and sealed. Apart from some small bequests with staff and old friends, the hall and the estate go to my nephew. Mm. You mentioned him in your letter. Young Michael, yes. He's running the estate already. I'm much too old for that. I can barely get into a Land Rover now, let alone drive it across the moor. Let alone walk across the moor. Never liked walking. <laughs> now I can't, anyway. Uh, Michael inherits directly, does he? Yes. Hmm. His parents, my sister and her husband, died a couple of years back, so that just leaves Michael. Ah. He only needs to be patient, though he's not very good at that, unfortunately. Did he ask to come here? Yes. He's been to university and studied farming and estate management, that sort of thing. Mm. Filled him full of silly notions, Mark. <laughs> but he'll run this place one day anyway, and I may manage to knock some sense into him before I turn my toes up. <laughs> up to your job there. Mm -hmm. Now, I'd better get Dolores. 
Mrs. Garcia to show you to your room. Oh, thank you. Give you a chance to clean up from the journey before dinner. Thank you. How, uh, how do you think we're doing, Holmes? Very well, Watson. Oh. It was a nice touch to get a few minutes alone to look at the portraits, mm. in case you meet anyone who resembles a Baskerville but isn't using that name. Ah, you noticed that that's what I was doing, did you? Mm. Well, we have the nephew, clearly at odds with Sir George, and then the housekeeper. I'm sure she's very significant. You think so too, eh? Tell me, I don't know much about the Philippines. Do they have voodoo there? You're only about 12,000 miles out, Watson. That's the Caribbean. And I thought the Philippines were the Caribbean. Well, that would explain why it took us so long to get here. You don't have to sound so patronising, Holmes. You know what your grandfather said. It is one of the elementary principles of practical reasoning that when the impossible has been eliminated, the residuum... However improbable, improbable must, must contain, contain the truth. Yes. It's just that we may differ on what we regard as impossible. But at least we can agree that that means we should go down for dinner. <laughs> I hope you've had sufficient, gentlemen. Quite, thank you. And how entertaining to be eating mango and prawns in the middle of Dartmoor. Yes, delicious. As Dolores tries to keep our menus interesting with some dishes from her own country. I wanted to ask about Mrs. Garcia, Sir George. Confidentially, of course. I say, you're a bit of a fast worker. <laughs> you've only been here a few hours and already you've got your eye on... <laughs> <laughs> no, it's nothing like that. Oh, there's no need to keep up a front with me. I can see you're a man after my own heart. Can't resist a pretty face. Eh? <laughs> Very astute of you, Sir George. Now, come now, Holmes. <laughs> now, what I meant, Sir George, was why a housekeeper from the Philippines? Because they are the best. I found that out when I was there towards the end of the war. I was attached to the American forces out there. Oh, they were good times. I remember so... But why this particular lady? What? Oh, well, it was, it was about the time the old housekeeper wanted to retire... An agency in London rang up and asked if I could take her. Unsolicited? As it happens, it has suited my book very well, since she was a widow. No family ties, you see, mm. even though she's barely 40. Oh. So she got the position, and very good she is, too. Most interesting. Don't you think, Holmes? Fascinating. Ah, sounds like Michael's back at last. Ah, good. He's been up to Bristol to arrange for some newfangled equipment he wants to buy. <laughs> Evening. Ah, uh, Mr. Holmes and Dr. Watson, I imagine. Yes, hello. Very pleased to see you. Well, now you are here, so I can you. leave you to entertain our guests. I Uncle can't Billy keep late hours anymore. Of course. <laughs> we should have a little oh, talk. Good night, Sir George. Good night, Sir George. Uncle, I wanted to discuss my meeting today. All in good time, Michael. Yes, but you I'm know Dolores doesn't like me talking business after dinner. Good night, gentlemen. Good night. Good night. Dolores this, Dolores that. I sometimes wonder who owns this place. Ah, you believe Mrs. Garcia exercises undue influence over Sir George? Well, he listens to her more than he does to me. And there's so much to talk to him about and to get done. Such as? Well, most of the estate is still being farmed with methods introduced by Uncle George's father when he came over from Canada. Hopelessly out of date. And then there's the hall itself just asking to be open to tourists. You mean people like... like the Japanese arriving in coaches? Well, I was thinking more of the Americans. Oh. oh I'd accept anyone who pays. Well, does all this need to happen now? Surely you'll inherit soon enough and be your own master. But how soon is soon, Mr. Holmes? I'm 40, so I haven't got time to waste. It could be years before I'm really in charge, and changes are needed now. <laughs> Did you hear that? Holmes. It's the hound. It certainly seems like it. Perhaps we could hear it a little more clearly if we went to the front door. I'll be damned if I set foot outside. You take this seriously, then? Well, what do you expect? Yes. It doesn't much matter to me whether it's real or someone just using the legend like they did the first time. No. Either way, it's likely to mean somebody's death. Mm. And that I don't care for. Mm. Mm. Uh, Sir George doesn't seem unduly concerned. Oh, why should he be? His life's almost over. I'm only halfway through mine. There's no sign of anything by day. And yet at night, we hear this. If I hear much more of it, I shall be shot of this place, inheritance or no inheritance. And if you'll take my advice, do as I do. Lock your doors until the morning. 
You're up and about early, Holmes. Uh, four poster beds may have charm, but they lack comfort. We need to bring this nonsense to a swift conclusion, if only to get back to a decent night's sleep. Well, I don't see how we can do that yet. It's getting more complicated all the time. The man with the incentive to kill Sir George seems genuinely frightened himself. That's bluff, of course. But we need to locate his hound before we can act. Oh, dear. Now, what about Mrs. Garcia interposing herself between the two of them? Perhaps she's on to Michael. But if so, why doesn't she tell us? Now, women are strange creatures. So what do you plan to do next? Oh, there's an odd job man who's here during the day, Fred Courtney. I thought we might speak to him. That would almost certainly be a man with a wart on his chin, a slight limp, and an old brown wheelbarrow. Really? How on earth do you deduce that? By looking over your shoulder. Oh, I see. Uh, Mr. Courtney! Everyone calls me Fred. Right. Fred, uh, I wonder if I could just ask you a couple of questions. You from the income tax? Oh, good Lord, no. <laughs> just a friend of Sir George's. What do you want, then? You've been here a few years, I suppose. What if I am? You must be seeing a few changes recently. Change? There's meddling more like. That's all anyone thinks of. Sir George's nephew, now, if he had his way, we'd all be out of a job with machines in our place. Tell me what machine knows the land like I do. Uh, Fred, if you know the country well, you'd know if there were an animal out in Grimpen Mire. I only knows about this earth. You tell me what tis that owls and nights and kills sheep and leaves no track. Exactly. About Mrs. Garcia. Her at the house? Yes. Foreign. Ah. Don't hold with foreigners. Don't trust them. And here's another busybody. Who's that? Doctor from Grimpen. Don't hold with doctors. Name the blind lead in the blind. <laughs> really? <laughs> i got to get these leaves swapped. Well, now, Darkest Grimpen is emancipated. Morning to you. Just visiting? Yes. My name is Watson, uh, and this is... Holmes, yes. So Sir George did send for you. Found out anything useful? No, it's a little earlier now. In investigation, uh... I see. You're malingering. Well, really, I've been going to say we can't divulge... A client's confidences, I see. Well, Sir George tells me everything. Well... Did, I should say, until that foreign woman arrived. Uh, you'll find Mrs. Garcia protects Sir George from... Me as well, that's right. And me, his doctor. Can't see what someone from a hot climate wants in Devon. Downright suspicious, if you ask me. Still, can't stay here chatting. Not in this life to enjoy myself. No. Hmm, the plot thickens, eh, Holmes? A gardener who doesn't like anyone and believes in the supernatural, and a doctor who thinks she's been supplanted by Mrs. Garcia. Ah. Oh. I propose we use the fine weather to see if the moor really is without traces of this, uh, well, how? I told you, there's nothing to see out there. You've wasted your day. Not at all. It was another excellent dinner. Mm -hmm. Yes. God, there it is again. I've had it now. In the morning, I'm off. Come on, Watson. Where to, Holmes? Outside, after your hound. Aren't we getting very close to the group of Meyer, Holmes? Yes. But whatever's making that noise is on dry land, so there should be little danger for us. Remarkable the way you never seem to be frightened, Holmes. That should be the direction. As I thought. Oh, goodness. Any moment now. Watson, have you got a license for that gun? When I'm on a desperate mission, I come prepared. That does frighten you. Just keep clear of my line of fire, Holmes. I most certainly will. Just a few more yards. There. Well done, Watson. Uh, I got it then. Yes. Oh, thank God. You shot and killed a stereo tape recorder. Oh. Yes, but, but, but how could you know it was only a recording? It's a very odd hound, spectral or otherwise, that repeats its howls exactly on consecutive nights. Now, there was a pattern for you. So all we need to do is trace the ownership of the tape recorder back to Michael, through the maker's number. Which your well-aimed bullet has destroyed. Yeah. Ah. 
Well, then, uh, fingerprints. We would need to call the police. No crime has been committed. No? So, so Michael placed it there just to scare Sir George, did he? But Sir George wasn't scared, was he? No. Even Michael would have perceived that by now. Oh. Well, well, then, if he didn't put it there, who did? You overlooked two tiny points, Watson. Two? How old is Mrs. Garcia? Oh, in her late thirties. And how long ago was Sir George in the Philippines? Uh, end of the war, so about thirty-eight. Good heavens! You mean... Exactly. Secondly, your concern for the portraits was admirable, but focused at the wrong ones. You look for a throwback to an early generation. Study instead just the eyes on that portrait of Sir George as a young man. Great Scott! Mrs. Garcia, the image of Sir George. Huh, a man who can't resist a pretty face. Yes, sir. Sir George is my father. Oh, come and join us, Mrs. Garcia. I thought you would notice the demise of your expensive tape recorder. Please don't tell Sir George. He doesn't know. He was never told my mother had his child. We need say nothing. Oh, thank you. Well, you've achieved your purpose anyway. You've scared Michael into leaving this morning. I just wanted to help Sir George end his days in peace. Mm. Yeah, but what, what about the will? Oh, I have no interest in the hall. Oh? When Sir George finally is at peace, I shall return to my own land. <laughs> but, but... I'll explain it, everything else it, it, and I'll drive back. We're going back now. Good night, Mrs. Garcia. I shall miss your cooking in London. Yes. So shall I. It's splendid to be back. Oh. All that grey stone on the moor was starting to depress me. Ah, what's this in the post? Holmes, one thing's troubling me. Hmm? What did savage that sheep? A wild animal, I imagine. But then it's still at large. Huh? Oh, he's still at large. What? The wild animal. Quite possibly. This is excellent. What, a new case already? An invitation from the director of the dig at Garlic Hythe to go and visit him. I must get out my Wellington boots. But Holmes, what about that sheep? Holmes? Holmes? <laughs> That episode of Second Home starred Peter Egan as Holmes and Jeremy Nicholas as Watson. Mrs. Garcia was played by Rosalind Adams, Baskerville by Anthony Newlands, and Michael by David Goodison, with Steve Hodson as Fred and Jean Trend as the Doctor. Second Homes was written by Grant Eustace and produced by Paul Mayhew Archer. Second Holmes by Grant Eustace, starring Peter Egan as Stamford Holmes and Jeremy Nicholas as Dr. Watson. Episode 2, The Case of the Maltese Pearls. Have I... Uh, hmm, uh, have I got time to get a paper before they call the flight, do you think, Holmes? Watson, you've got time to buy and read... War and Peace. Oh, come now, Holmes, we're not that early. Any earlier, we'd have to stay overnight. Now, you know how bad the traffic gets on the approaches to Heathrow first thing in the morning. If you followed my suggestion, the traffic would have been irrelevant. To take a helicopter from central London to here would have been gross extravagance. But I enjoy being extravagant. Yeah, but I don't enjoy helicopters. How do you know? You've never been in one. I have the trained eye of a doctor, Holmes. I know when things are going to disagree with me, and there's something most disagreeable about trusting your life to a contraption that bears no relationship to anything in nature. On that yardstick, aeroplane's a little better, Watson. Mm? Man and nature are considerably at odds about flying. For example, according to some aerodynamic thought, the power-weight ratio of a bee means that it is quite incapable of flight. Really? Hmm. Well, again, now I refuse to let you go with me into the same state as some of these other people here. What do you mean? Ah, you see, the trained eye of the doctor. Uh. Mm. At a rough estimate, nearly a third of these passengers are suffering from self-inflicted stress. 
Will I miss the flight? Did I remember to lock the house? Have I got the passport? Will the weather be all right when I get there? Have I got time to buy a paper? Have I got time? Mm. Now, you're not suggesting I'm under stress. You decided to accompany me because you've been working too hard and could use the rest, you said. True. But what worried me was that if you went to Malta on your own, it would be a devil of a job getting you back, and there'd be cases piling up in London and you doing nothing about them. Oh, what a delightful thought. Exactly. At least now I know I can make sure you answer the call of your true profession when you're needed. Oh, my profession. If only my grandfather had stuck to chemistry. And I have no intention of getting myself as worked up as... Well, that chap, say. You mean the German computer salesman with the leg injury sustained in a parachute jump? Yes, I, I think so. That one there. He's every right to feel stressed. His wife has just spilled a cup of tea over his trousers. Ooh. Well, that chap over there is another one. <laughs> in that instance, at least, you've proved your point. Ah. But anyone who is foolish enough to father three children and then go travelling with them gets no sympathy from me. <laughs> British Airways announced a departure of flight BA-552 to Malta. 552? That's us, isn't it? That's well deduced, Watson. Well, I'm damned. I still haven't bought that paper. Well, throw yourself on the mercy of the cabin staff, Watson. They must have something on the aircraft you can read. Your newspaper, Dr. Watson. What? Oh, thank you. How is it you know my name? Oh, you're too modest, Doctor, if you need ask that. A fault I'm constantly chiding him about. From what you've written about Mr. Holmes here, I couldn't imagine anyone else would be on such good terms with him. <laughs> a bit of deduction, eh? You appear to have found a kindred spirit, Watson. Are you flying to Malta on the case? Fortunately, no. Watson is having a much-deserved holiday. And Holmes has nothing better to do than come all this way to look at some old people. Fresh documents, Watson, from the time of the Knights of Malta. <laughs> Knights of Malta. Only just come tonight <laughs> after all these years, and I've obtained permission to examine them. Such a waste of talent. Cheer up, Dr. Watson. I'm sure some crime will turn up for you. Please, don't encourage him, young lady. I wonder... Would you mind letting me have your autographs? We're not supposed to ask, but, well, you are rather special people. Not humdrum like most of the people we have to fly. Yes, of course. Can I... we write, write some sort of message? To Jane would be fine. Thanks ever so much. I must dash. Jane, eh? Oh, charming girl. Charming. So encouraging to know we're not humdrum, don't you think, Watson? of hotel, Holmes. <laughs> Always something I can leave safely in your hands. I'm not at all sure my ego can absorb all these compliments. Not only am I not humdrum, but now I have moderately good taste in hotels. But be a good fellow and do the checking in for both of us, will you? Oh, do you There'll be no problem. All... They know me here. Oh. If I don't leave at once, I'll be late for my appointment at the library. Mm. Well, if you uh... restrict yourself to the letter today, Watson, let me recommend Fort St. Elmo, the armory, and the inside of the cathedral. Yeah, well, actually... Hmm? Well, I, I thought I'd spend a bit of time by the swimming pool. The swimming well, pool? Well, it's a nice day, after all. Such a severely practical mind. The buildings have been here for four centuries, and so should still be here tomorrow. But who knows if the fine weather will be? Uh, you rest your way, Holmes, and let me rest mine. Well, just remember how hot the sun is here. At a pinch, I will eat lobster, but I don't want one as a travelling companion. Nag, 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 that's all I... Over here, Holmes. Oh, Watson. <laughs> what on earth possessed you to buy striped bathing trunks? Mm -hmm. I think they're very becoming. Oh, thank you. Ah, Miss Jane. And you, Tarzan, eh, Watson? Oh, Holmes, really. Jane Mapleton. From our flight, remember? I have some slight recollection. The crew is stopping over here. We, uh, we just bumped into each other. Literally? Well, yes, actually. I knocked the first officer into the pool. <laughs> Dr. Watson's been telling me about some of your past cases. It's a form of hypnosis he's always practising. Come now, Holmes. Some of the ones he hasn't been able to publish are extraordinary. You shouldn't believe all you are told by gaudily dressed gentlemen encountered beside swimming pools. I told you in London I'm not going to rise to your taunts, Holmes. I'm here to relax and enjoy myself. Have you had a successful day, Mr. Holmes? Most satisfactory. Fascinating documents. They throw a whole new light on some of the decisions taken during the Great Sea. Does that mean you'll be able to join us now? No, I've brought some photocopies back. I can put in a little more work before dinner. 
But you see, Watson, the messages that were smuggled across Grand Harbour at night are particularly revealing, because up Holmes, until now... I'm sure it's all very interesting, but could we have a bit of a break from it? Of course, Watson. I'm sorry. Hmm. Uh, is there anything we can profitably discuss about your lying in the sunshine? Oh, certainly. I learned, for example, that being an airline stewardess and being a detective have a lot in common. Really? I'm really sizing people up, judging their mood and so on. Oh, very interesting. Hmm. Did you also learn from Miss Mapleton why she is so agitated? Oh, do you think she is? She is now, unless I'm very much mistaken. Oh, I'm sorry to interrupt you at dinner. Oh, not at all, not at all. Uh, come and join us. Is, um, is something the matter? Have you read today's paper? I have read nothing later than the 16th century since we arrived. But you know about the pearls of St. John? No. Part of the regalia of the Grand Master of the Knights of St. John. That's right. Oh, those pearls? Currently on show in London as part of an exhibition about Malta. Which is why the paper here has pounced on it. You see? you better give that to Watson. He's developed a certain flair for reading the news aloud. All right, let's see. Oh, it's headed attempted theft of pearls. Mm. In London last night, an attempt was made to steal the Pearls of St. John, which are the centrepiece of the Malta exhibition being staged there all this month. Oh, you're right about that, Holmes. Thank you, Watson. Unfortunately, the private security firm engaged by the Maltese government managed to prevent the theft. The owner of the gallery where the exhibition is being held is helping police with their inquiries. A full statement about the incident is expected from Scotland Yard hourly. Hmm. Well, since I can't imagine you share Holmes's obsession with the Knights of Malta, your interest must centre on the gallery. On the man who owns it. Oh, uh, he's a very good friend, is he? He's my brother, Charles. Oh, I see. <laughs> well, uh, what do you think of the newspaper report, Holmes? Uh, the style is adequate, though somewhat lacking in inspiration. What about the crime, Holmes? Well, there's scarcely the information to form any view at all. I know that Charles wouldn't do anything criminal. He's not the brainiest of people, so he may have done something stupid, but not criminal. So can we help in any way? Oh, that's what I wanted to ask you. Ah. I have to go back on tomorrow morning's flight anyway, but I was hoping you might be persuaded to come back to London too and give Charles some help if he really is in trouble. Of course we will, won't we, Holmes? I'm sure we won't be able to get seats on the plane at this short notice. I checked. You'll be able to get on. Oh. But I have access to those papers for another two days. Holmes, we should be concerned about the living, not the dead. And you do have photocopies, Mr. Holmes. That was an unguarded remark of mine. Oh, very well, I suppose we must go back. Oh, oh good. At least in London, Watson won't wear those swimming trunks. Extraordinary how the focus changes when you're back, Holmes. The story splashed all over the front page in Malta. Hard even to find in the papers here. Giving the case the attention it deserves. Uh, it doesn't look good for Jane's brother. The security firm's patrol came past the gallery at about half past ten. Not only did they see Charles Mapleton inside, but he was standing close to the case which contained the pearls. That's hardly grounds for a charge. No, but there's more. The Maltese official who was called said that the pearls inside the case had been moved. Mapleton admitted he'd opened the case, but only to adjust the pearls. Difficult to prove otherwise. Answer that, there's a good chap. I just want to finish translating this page. Stanford Holmes's residence. Good Lord, people will think I've got a butler now. Oh, hello, Jane. Oh, that's good news. Yes, of course, bring him round right away. Oh. Not at all. See you in a few minutes. Bye. Jane's brother's been released. He clearly didn't help the police inquiries quite enough. She's bringing him round here. Oh, no. So now he should get the whole story. The excitement of waiting is almost too intense to bear. So what really occurred? How do I know this isn't going to be repeated to the police? Please trust them, Charles. Just because you've been released, you're not out of the wood yet. You may need friends. I shall perhaps mention to you that you run the risk of Dr. Watson publishing a story in which you feature prominently. Oh, I'm not very keen on that. That could be avoided, couldn't it? Well, yes, of course. Not that I've broken any laws, but, um, well, I've been a bit of a fool, I suppose. Ah, Jane prepared us for that. What? Uh, well, so there'd be some explanation. Oh. <clears throat> uh, this all has to do with a woman. Aha! What does that mean? Well, it's just, um, 
Well, Holmes's experience is that in bizarre cases, there's, there's usually a woman involved. What's bizarre about this? Just tell us what happened, Charles. Well, I've been seeing a lot of a girl called Marika over the weekend. Marika, eh? Foreign-sounding name. Well done, Watson. Swiss. Yeah, in London, on holiday. Only been here for a couple of days. So, a Swiss tourist, eh? Is that relevant? Could be. Who knows? Well, I thought you might. How did you meet her? Well, it was more like collided in St. James's Street. I knocked her handbag flying. <sighs> well, I helped her pick up the contents and, uh, well, we just got talking and it developed from there. So what about the night before last? We'd had a good dinner and I'd been talking about the exhibition. Um, she said she'd love to see the pearls. Well, I, I couldn't see any harm in it, so we drove round to the gallery. When you said a good dinner, mm -hmm. did you refer to the quality or the quantity? Oh, well, I don't take a girl out for sausage and mash. But we didn't eat that much, and we didn't stop for a sweet or even coffee. You do ask the weirdest questions. Well, it's all part of our profession. If they don't know everything, Charles, there won't be much help to you. When we got to the gallery, Marika was very taken with the pearls. She asked if she could try them on. I was a bit reluctant, but, um, well, she had a very persuasive way about it. Yes, I don't think we need to go into that. But I thought you wanted all yeah, the details. There's, there's a lady present. Oh, Jane won't mind. Oh, I do get on with it, but... Charles. She had a small camera in her bag and asked me if I'd take a picture of her wearing the pearls. Good Lord! Did she have the camera in her bag when you bumped into her? Very good, Miss Mapleton. Well, how should I know? She didn't spill everything out of it. So after the photo, I put the pearls back in their case. Ah! Was she reluctant to part with them? Not at all. Oh. But when I'd locked the case and looked around, she'd gone. To let in an accomplice, no doubt. No, the police searched the gallery. It was empty. Oh. The next moment, the security patrol was hammering on the door. The rest you know. Why didn't you tell the police all this? Oh, good thing I didn't. Apart from making me look an idiot, well, I wanted to be sure Marika would back me up. Which she wouldn't have. Because I rang her hotel when the police let me go home. She checked out. Oh. It's pretty complicated, this case, eh, Holmes? Oh, very, Watson. Well, I've had enough of it for the time being. Police don't run an impressive hotel, <laughs> so I uh, need to catch up on my sleep. I'll drive you back to the flat. Thanks. You know where to contact me if you need to, Dr. Watson. Yes, of course, Jane. We've seen some odd ones in our time, Holmes, but this... The only thing that is clear is that someone is trying to steal the pearls. If that is the case, they're being singularly incompetent. But surely, if you consider the events, they can only point to one conclusion. Then why was the photograph taken? Uh, to enable a copy of the pearls to be made. Good Lord, they plan to substitute them. No, Watson. A copy of the exhibition catalogue and a visit to the gallery would have served better. Uh. Now, what of this apparent chance meeting in the street? Uh. The ladies wished to see the pearls at night, when she could quite easily have called during the daytime. Uh. The lady's reluctance to eat a complete meal at someone else's expense. Uh. The camera at the ready in her bag, a point Miss Mapleton astutely noticed. Uh. The arrival of the security patrol at the exact moment, uh. and the lady's departure at precisely the same time. <laughs> oh, well, we only have Mapleton's word for a lot of that. Great Scott, perhaps it's Mapleton himself. There never was a now, girl. Let us approach this from the point of view that what this rather immature young man says is true and see where that hypothesis leads us. Well? Uh, it leads us clearly, does it not, towards a contrived meeting and subsequent relationship in order to be in the gallery at that precise time with the certain knowledge that the security patrol will be on hand. Ah, oh, but how could the girl know that? The papers say that the patrols are at random time. That is something which can be easily checked. Watson? Hmm? Oh, right. Now, if I can have a few moments quiet, I shall return to 16th century, Malta. All right, thank you. Goodbye. Correct again, Holmes, of course. The security firm had an anonymous tip-off to go past at 10.30. But what was the point of that? I imagine the photograph is the key. It may have escaped your notice, Holmes, but the photograph could easily be in Switzerland by now. Oh, don't tell me there's another case already. <laughs>
before this one's even sold. If it is, I shall escape to 20th century Malta immediately. It's Jane Holmes. Not another of your relatives under arrest so soon, Miss Mapleton. No, Mr. Holmes, it's this. In the post when we got to Charles's flat. Ah, as I thought. I believe you were under the impression this might have left the country, Watson. Good heavens, the photograph. But why has it been sent to Jane's brother? <laughs> of course. I deduce it. <laughs> Uh, it seemed to me that if Charles had told the police the whole story, he wouldn't really be able to prove the girl's existence. Now he can. I say. But it's been sent only after the girls had a chance to get away. I begin to see, Miss Mapleton, why Watson saw connections with your profession and that of a detective. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Holmes. But that would imply that the girl doesn't mind her picture being seen. She would probably welcome it. Holmes, did you notice that the gallery clock is in the picture? German, made in Nuremberg in about 1825. Oh, really? But it's saying just before 10.30. The time must be important. Well done, Watson. Of course. <laughs> As we thought. It's nothing to do with the pearls. The girl is proving she was in London at that time. Exactly. And for what reason does one usually need such an alibi? <laughs> well, because there's been some crime committed at precisely that time for which she's a suspect. That's right. I must get on to the police right away. Uh, be a good chap and do it quietly, will you? got all the threads now. Why must you drag me all this way? Well, driving to Surrey isn't far, Holmes. You go to Malta for far less. And you deserve to be in at the kill. Is that a bit mm. violence, then? Oh, you know what I mean. Oh, good heavens! Did you see that signpost? Should we have taken that turning? No, no. It was marked Stoke Moran. <laughs> That was the scene of one of the most dramatic cases that Holmes's grandfather and my grandfather were involved in. The speckled bat. Oh, yes, I know the story, I think. Excellent. That will spare us Watson retelling it. Hmm. Too much to hope that this place we're going to will be in the same class, I suppose. I trust so. If there is a baboon loose in the grounds, I shall return to London at once. A baboon? Mere leatherhead? <laughs> so the official version of the speckled band would have us believe. <laughs> and a snake that lived in a safe, too. You see that Watson's habit of embellishing a plain tale runs in his family. Well, I haven't made up the fact that this man, Neville Clark, was attacked in his own house at exactly 10.30, the evening before last. How can you be so exact about the time, Mr. Clark? Well, that grandfather clock chimes every quarter of an hour. Ah. Look, I've been through all this with the police. Surely they don't need a private detective on the case as well. well we may have come upon information which the police do not yet have. Tell me, have you seen the young lady in this photograph before? Well, that's... that's Krista. Krista? Another alias, eh? That's the girl who attacked me. Mr. Clark, if you know the time on the clock in the picture... Old German one, as a matter of fact. Thank you, Watson. You will see that it's showing the same time as the assault on you. But was this taken two nights ago? It was. There's no question you're mistaken? None at all. Ridiculous question. That's extraordinary. On the contrary. It was totally predictable. But why do you say she did it? Uh, well, because I was expecting her here then. She'd gone up to London for a couple of days before her holiday was over. She was... Yes. Uh, going to spend the last two nights staying here. I see. <clears throat> you, uh, you know her some time, then? No, I only met her last week. She was just a tourist. You make a habit of this sort of thing, do you? I don't answer questions made in that tone of voice. Not tone Did of you voice, see your I assailant? Uh, no. No, I just heard a noise. I went into the study, and that was the last I knew for about 20 minutes. How are you knocked out? With one of my own ornaments from the mantelpiece. Smashed to pieces. So, what did this burglar steal? Huh. Well, that's the damn fool part. Nothing. Nothing at all? That's what I said, isn't it? Didn't even touch anything if the fingerprint people know what they're doing. Powder all over the house, not a trace of a print. Now, look, uh, take your photo to the police, will you, and leave me and my headache in peace. Ah, here we are. Lemon tea. For the lady. Thank you. Coffee? For me. Thank 
you. So you'll be the pot of tea, then? Very reasonable deduction. No need to be rude. Tourists. Humorless woman. Now, but what sort of burglar doesn't take anything even when the occupant of the house is unconscious? A woman. Why do you say that? I don't know about the burglary, but the alibi with Charles and the photo makes it obvious to me. No man would plan something that relied on a woman getting a man to do exactly as she wanted. His pride wouldn't let him believe in it. A woman would know how easily it could be done. Good Lord, Jane. <laughs> bit cynical. No, there is a certain elegant logic in that. Man or woman, you don't set up something like this to burgle a house and then not take anything. I agree. Oh, really? So, what can we deduce? Uh, the woman has gone to extreme lengths to keep her identity secret. So I think Clark knows her. Agreed. But she didn't intend to attack him because she had to use an ornament. Picked it up in the heat of the moment when, when Clark came into the study unexpectedly. Very good, Watson. Oh. I say. So she did come to steal, not assault. Then why didn't she? Perhaps she did. I shall have another word with Mr. Clark, and to save wasting any more precious time, you drop me there and then start investigating the local hotels. Local hotels? We're oh looking for a Swiss lady. Or German or Austrian, I imagine. Checked in about a week ago and left yesterday. Drink up, Watson. We're nearly there. No, yes, of course. Mm. Sorry. Look, I thought I said that I, I shall didn't want leave to... just as soon as we've resolved this. Now, assume your attacker was a woman you know. She takes no money or valuables. What else do you have that might interest her? Nothing. I find that difficult to believe. Meaning that I'm lying? I was trying to express it as delicately as I could, but if you insist on the word, I will not contradict you. Now, what souvenirs do you keep of your lady friends? Hmm? Incriminating letters, perhaps? What are you talking about? Or is it photographs? Let's have a look in your desk for a start. You've got a bloody nerve. Stay exactly where you are, Mr. Clark. Now, what have we here? A photo album. Uh, keep your hands off that. Oh, yes. Quite a collection of ladies, all carefully annotated. Now, look here. Ah, one missing. What? Miss Catherine Rollinger. What? Why, the scheming little bitch has stolen her picture. More power to her elbow. I'll take the rest. Give that back to if me. If you wish me to place a second lump on the back of your head to match the first, I shall be pleased to do so. That is my property. Material for blackmail is forfeit. Well, you've got no case against me. Taking photographs of young ladies in what I can only describe as compromising circumstances will lead to that if it hasn't already done so. And if Fraulein Rollinger found it necessary to come all this way, you are doubtless not as innocent as you suggest. What are you going to do with it? Destroy it. I see all these are Polaroid photographs, so I don't need to trouble you for the negatives. Good morning, Mr. Clark. We found her, Holmes. Of course you did. And she's still here. Is she? She is a cool customer. Look, I left Jane to watch the hotel and came back for you. Come on. All right, Watson. There's Jane, over there. I'm afraid she's left, Mr. Holmes. What? Not long after you went, a taxi drew up. She came out of the hotel and got in. I rushed over to see if I could catch the instructions to the driver, and she wound down the window and gave me this. Then the taxi drove off. Good Lord, this letter's addressed to you, Holmes. She's clever as well as cool. Go on, Watson, you're bursting to open it. Oh, right. <clears throat> Dear Mr. Holmes... I had planned not, not to draw, draw attention, attention to, to myself, myself by, by a sudden, sudden departure. departure. But, but where Dr. Watson and your other charming helper are, you cannot be far behind. So, you find the nest empty. You will have discovered it was me who entered Neville Clark's house. I did not intend to harm him, but I am not sorry that it happened. It was not the money he asked for, but the threat to send the photograph to my fiancée. Austria is a very conservative country, and a family with Habsburg blood in it even more so. I was not prepared to have my future happiness spoiled by one youthful indiscretion. I enclose a small memento of my, my younger, younger cousin. Cousin? Oh, it must be in the envelope. Ah, a negative. Why, it's the girl in the gallery. She has a definite touch. It's signed Catherine, Catherine Rollinger, yes. At the risk of compounding a felony, we'll let her go. Uh -huh. Clark only got what he deserved. 
I still don't understand. Oh, Watson. Catherine knew that if Clark noticed the break-in, he would phone the police. She, therefore, had to make sure he would immediately suspect someone else, not her. Hence the setting up of the relationship between him and her cousin. Well done, Miss Mapleton. Eh, Watson? Uh... Oh, yes. But Catherine also had to make sure that her cousin wouldn't be arrested. That's why she arranged that alibi involving my brother. By the time the truth came out, the two girls would be out of the country. Good. And now we can return to London. I have an album to burn, and then perhaps I should consider visiting Vienna to research into the Habsburg archives, perhaps? The lady does have a record of hitting men over the head, Mr. Holmes. You're right. It would be a trifle wearisome making sure I never turn my back on her. Holmes, you can't possibly go to Austria. There'll be more cases to solve here. But just think, Watson, you might find yourself on another flight with Jane here among the cabin crew. That's easily arranged. Uh, really? <laughs> well, of course they... You see, Vienna's a most attractive city. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I mean it. And then, then there's that delightful Strauss music. And good Lord, all those chocolate cakes. You know them, what would they call them? That episode of Second Home starred Peter Egan as Holmes and Jeremy Nicholas as Watson, with Catherine Hurlbut as Jane Mapleton. Charles Mapleton was played by Alex Jennings, Neville Clark by Edward Cast, and Katrin by Wendy Murray. Second Holmes was written by Grant Eustace and produced by Paul Mayhew Archer. Second Holmes by Grant Eustace, starring Peter Egan as Stamford Holmes and Jeremy Nicholas as Dr. Watson. Episode 3, The Case of the Reading Undertaker. Holmes! 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 Have a look at this. Calm yourself, Watson. Remember your uh, blood pressure. Oh, yes, yes. But have you seen have you seen today's newspaper, Holmes? Of course, and I'm encouraged to think there's something I could be doing after all. Ah, I knew that murder weapon would catch your interest. Which murder weapon is that? What? Oh, this case in Reading. You mean you haven't seen it? Oh, then what, what were you referring to? Well, you have the paper. Why not deduce it? Ah, yes, of course. <laughs> right. <laughs> Let's see. Now, what's this? Miss Angela Wainwright of Fulham has become the fourth young lady in less than two weeks to have been assaulted while crossing Hyde Park. The description in each instance has been of a tall, thin man wearing a long, flowing coat. Great Scott, Holmes! You don't mean to say that... Your imagination is running away with you, Watson. I may be bored, but I'm not that bored. Oh, sorry, Holmes. Yes, sir. Well, I can't say anything else about criminal activities. I don't recall mentioning anything criminal. Try the article at the top on the right. Hmm? Uh, 50th anniversary of solo flight to Australia. You mean that? Absolutely. Don't you think it would be immensely stimulating to retrace the route of one of those pioneer aviators across the mountains and the desert and the sea? Especially if I could get hold of an original aircraft of the period. Oh, Lord. Of course, I shall need to become a pilot first myself, but it's really time I got round to that. I can't imagine it would be difficult. Uh, Holmes, stop right there. Well, I don't see why it should be difficult. It's not good enough. This is just another of your attempts to disregard your destiny. My destiny. But don't you realise who you are? When I forget, I'm sure you'll remind me. Someone has to. Does it mean nothing to you that your father's last wish was that you continue in this profession, just as he took over from your grandfather? Am I to carry that cross for the rest of my life? And you, a logical man, you ignore the most compelling reason of all. I said I'd learn to fly first. No, no, I... No, I mean that you're wasting your precious... Your unique talents for analytical detection. A child's tricks, Watson, you know that. Like asking you who the lady is. What do you mean? For five years, you have conscientiously worn either your old school tie or that awful regimental one. If you now appear wearing a tie in rather subtle shades of pale blue, I can be forgiven for detecting a female touch? Well, you... Uh, you... <laughs> 
you, you're right, of course. <laughs> yeah. Oh, there you are. Are you going to squander that skill on, 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 on aeroplanes? What would you suggest I squander it on? Just listen to this. Uh, I am listening. Bizarre death in Berkshire. Hmm. The body of Mr. Andrew Gerard was found yesterday near the village of Burrowfield. He had apparently been on his bicycle when he was struck and instantly killed by a crossbow bolt. A crossbow bolt. Mr. Hmm. Gerard, who was a partner in a prosperous funeral direction business in Reading, was in the habit of taking long bicycle rides at the weekends. A police spokesman indicated that an early arrest was expected. That. Now, you're always saying these dreary times are sapping the ingenuity of the criminal classes. I recall passing that remark only once. Yeah, but where are the exotic devices for murder that your family and my family had to investigate, eh? Like uh, uh, Colonel Moran's noiseless air gun, firing soft nose revolver ammunition. Hmm? Times have changed, Watson, even if you refuse to accept the fact. Not at all. Here is such a device. Who ever heard of a crossbow being used in the 1980s? I think you should go down and take a closer look. <laughs> but it talks of an early arrest. Oh, that's the usual police line, isn't it? Say anything less and they sound incompetent. Well, of course, they probably are. Now, come on, Holmes, can you resist this challenge? Easily. Now, if you come with a case involving someone who thinks on a really grand scale, an Ayatollah, perhaps? Oh, good Lord. Someone showing really engaging, paranoid tendencies. Now, you won't divert me, Holmes. Iran can wait. Reading cannot. Uh, can your new companion spare you? Oh, yes. Pity. But Jane's visiting her aunt in the north. Oh, Jane. That wouldn't be the Jane we encountered in that trifling little incident with the pearls, would it? Was well, uh, Yes. As a matter of fact, it is. <laughs> well, well, old Baskerville was right. You can't resist her pretty face. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Yeah, the trouble is, I've, I've lent her my car to go to Yorkshire. Dear me, she may never get there, then. And my car's being serviced. Still, it's only half an hour on the train from Paddington. Train? Oh, come on, Holmes. No more prevarication. Just two weary Londoners who badly need some good Berkshire air, eh? Oh, Watson, my grandfather said that. <laughs> yes, I, I might have known you recognised that one. <laughs> hmm. Right, well, I'll just ring ahead to get the local police inspector to meet the train. Oh... <sighs> That'll be him, Holmes. You can tell there's plainclothes police anywhere. They all wear the same manner, eh? Mm. Mr. Holmes? Doctor? Inspector Fowler. How do you do? I know your reputation, of course, and I'm sure I'm flattered you should want to come and look at a small local incident. Uh, but I'm afraid you've had a wasted journey. Oh? As expected, we've made an arrest. Good. Well, in that case... Holmes? Uh, very well. I hope, now we're here, you'll still let us at least glance at the case. It presents a few features of interest. Uh, as you wish, but uh, you realise I'm a very busy man. And Fine, I... so the sooner we begin, the sooner it's over. We don't waste any time down here. Uh, the man we've arrested is Charles Sawyer. All rather pathetic, really. He was infatuated with a girl called Janet Durham. Durham, eh? And she had no interest in him at all, but he was very persistent. Then last week, Miss Durham got engaged to Gerard, the undertaker. Ah. Sawyer knew nothing about this relationship until he read the announcement in the papers. The news seemed to have quite unhinged him. Extraordinary. Yeah. He went out, if you'll excuse the phrase, gunning for Gerard. <laughs> with a crossbow. Yeah, and that's what led us to him. His hobby's archery. As well as his modern bows, he owns some historical weapons, one of which is a crossbow. The Sawyer has some sort of story, I imagine. Oh, all you can find to say is that he missed one of the crossbow bolts a few days ago. But, of course, he didn't come forward to report the loss until after the murder. We'll have no problem making this one stick. There's your body, gentlemen. Hmm. It's a very small wound the bolt's made. Hmm. It's devilish sharp. I've got it here. You just feel that. It seems adequate to ensure death. I'm sure you'd like to see it, Watson. Well, thank you, Holmes. <laughs> it won't smell after 500 years, Doctor. Don't neglect non-verbal communication, Inspector. We must involve all our senses, eh, Holmes? I'm sure you're right. Just, uh, just give me a hand with the body, Holmes, would you? Uh, where are you taking it? No, no, I just want to turn it over. Uh, ah. 
If you'd asked, I could have told you the bolt went all the way through. I'm sure you could. Was Gerard a rich man? How do you know that? If I had known, there would be precious little point in asking the question. Oh. Oh, well, he inherited a lot of money when his mother died. Ah. He was one of two sons. The other one left home under something of a cloud as a young man and got nothing. Gerard was uh, pretty much of a miser by all accounts and hardly spent anything. And he didn't trust banks. We found all the money, close on 100,000, in his cellar, in a coffin. In a co... Good heavens, that's a bit macabre. A professional failing, no doubt. And who gets this money? Oh, that's for the court to decide. There's no will. I see. Oh, but it's not a big problem since he had no relatives. What about the brother? Died in a mine explosion last year in South Africa. Nasty. He'd emigrated out there and became a mining engineer. So now, can we go to what Dr. Watson's stories insists on terming the scene of the crime? <laughs> Gerald's body was found over there, where the road curves. And the bolt was fired from here. Uh, you can see where the crossbow has depressed the hedge. Hmm, it certainly looks like that. You see, Holmes? Yes, thank you. Uh, who lives over there? Huh? Oh, the uh, general. Uh, at least the locals call him that. He's a retired soldier. Is this all his land? On that side of the road, yes. Mm, right. Thank you. Now, where's he off to? Unlike myself, Inspector, Watson enjoys the hunt. I would happily have caught the next train back to London... But it seems we must leave no stone unturned. <laughs> well, you can take it from me. I've turned all there are. Ah. Good day to you. Come on, Holmes! All right, I'm coming. Fowler's going off in a bit of a huff. Mm. Competition's getting a bit too hot for him, is it? <laughs> we better go and have a word with the general, don't you think? And that looks like the most direct path. I think Fowler's got the wrong man, don't you, Holmes? What makes you say that? Well, for a start, the police always do get the wrong man. <laughs> and then the fact that he is the only possible suspect. Was it not inordinately helpful of him to use the very weapon that would single him out among the entire population of the Reading area? Well, Fowler said love had made him lose command of his senses. <laughs> That's a state which occurs in real life less than the writers of cheap paperbacks would have us believe. Well, certainly the most it has made you do is change your tie. No, Holmes, it won't do at all, will it? The proposition is riddled with inconsistency. Why choose the cumbersome crossbow if you're an archer? Hmm. Why choose a, a quiet piece of country lane for an ambush and then in broad daylight stand resting your crossbow on the hedge? Would, would Fowler have us believe that this wretched undertaker cycled unhesitatingly towards someone pointing a crossbow at him? As it is, I've discovered that the bolt was actually fired from that clump of trees above the road. Well, you have got the bit between your teeth. And as your grandfather would have said, Holmes, Fowler has not observed, and yet he has seen. Hmm. The wound in Gerard's back was a small but nevertheless perceptible distance below the entry point in the chest. Thus, he was not killed by someone on his own level, but by someone a little above him. Good Lord. Those trees are a long way further back. You said yourself that a crossbow is accurate only over a short distance. Quite so. So the bolt wasn't fired from a crossbow. Well done, Watson. Elementary, eh, Holmes? Hmm? Oh. <laughs> ah, here we are. Try the bell. Ah. Know the name, of course. Not a soldier, were you? I'm afraid I'm a... Hey, you, you'll have to speak up. I'm a bit deaf. Gunner, you see. It happens to the best of you when you have artillery firing around you all day long. I'm afraid I am a consulting detective. Ah, that one. Got it now. About the death of Gerard, is it? Yes. Good riddance. Wretched little squirt. Aha. Uh -huh. Now, why didn't you like him? My wife's funeral. Complete botch of it he made. Embarrassing. Only interested in money, you see. No thought for personal feelings. Mm. Uh, young Sawyer's done a service there to Janet Durham, I shouldn't wonder. Mm. Pretty girl. You should. Mm. Don't know what put it into her head to marry him. Can't have any brains. 
But then most of them don't, do they? Oh, and I remember don't. my... Do you, do you do a lot of shooting on your estate? Uh, yes, yes. Like to hear the noise, you know. Really? Uh, can't hit much now. I'm as blind as a bat. Or well, do you shoot in the copse down towards the road? Can see you're no soldier. No soldier? Well, <laughs> and it'd be like trying to fire inside a trench. Now, most of the shooting's done over this side of the estate. Look, I'll show you. Come over to the window. No soldier, indeed. <laughs> With all my time in the TA. Watson, I'm not deaf. Still, hmm. even if he is an old fool, he put his finger on a point that's been troubling me. When we saw the body, it was clear that Gerard was anything but good-looking. Now, the general cast doubt on his personality. So what attracted Miss Durham into marriage? Well, don't ask me, Watson. You're the one who knows the fair sex. Oh, come now. <laughs> You make me sound like Casanova. Now, who should we interview next? Mine host of the Feathers. You think he might be important? Unless I am very much mistaken, their port used to be above mediocrity, and the linen above reproach. Holmes, really, can you never keep your mind on a case for more than five minutes? Not if I can help it. Well, oh, I like a top. Mm. Must be all this fresh air. How about you? Oh, I got a few hours. I know that tone of voice, Holmes. What have you been up to? Oh, just a little housebreaking. Oh. Those scrambled eggs look excellent. Housebreaking? Holmes, you'll get yourself arrested. Only if you continue shouting about it to the remainder of the dining room. Perhaps. Well, have you gone mad? I don't think so. Mmm, this is delicious. Oh, oh. oh. I beg your pardon. What on earth could have possessed you? Oh, I see. Pass me some more of that bacon, would you? Thank you. I was bored, and besides, you're always lecturing me about my talents, Watson. So I was trying just not to let one or two get rusty. Yes, but what about this case? It's high time we started making some calls. But I've hardly started eating. Those must be the undertaker's premises. And by Jove, we've seen that car before. It was at the General's farm. I recognised the number plate. A white rover with a scratch on the rear bumper and straw on the mud flap. Yes, it is the same car. Scratch? Oh, yes, so it has. Good gracious, there's the General coming out of the Undertaker's. You two again? They seem to be everywhere. What are you up to now? Uh, we are making progress, General. Have you thought of asking the General to write down his address? Oh, of course, it's a sample of handwriting. Uh, General, I wonder if you'd mind giving us a sample of your address. Address? Well, yeah, I mean, uh, write down your address. In case we need to call on you again. Ah, you, well, uh, you've got something to write with. Uh, oh. um, well, there you are, General. Ah, thank you. Yeah, it's, uh, yeah. Bit of a scrawl, I'm afraid. Thank you. Mm. Yeah, it must be off. Haven't got time to waste at my time of life, eh? Good hunting to you. Come on, Holmes. Let's go inside. How long have you been Mr. Gerard's partner, Mr. Lamson? Four years. How did that come about? I was the only one to stand up to him. What does that mean, exactly? He bought all the others out. When he bought up my firm, I held out for being his partner. I was the last firm in Reading, and his pride said he had to have everything, so he agreed. One part of your partnership agreement interests me. It is the unusual provision that in the event of one partner dying without leaving a will, the total partnership reverts to the ownership of the other. How could you know that? It's Homer's profession to know such things. Well, I'd got Gerard worked out. He was a man of this world. He set no store by wills. I knew I'd have the last laugh. Ah, so if you found out that he was drawing up such a document, it would be in your interest to see that he died first. Now, just a minute. You're not a policeman. You, you, you can't accuse Holmes me. Holmes only makes accusations once he is in possession of all the facts. Don't you, Holmes? Absolutely. It's those we are trying to elicit. Was I correct? Yes. 
But I had no reason to think Gerard had made a will. Hmm. Thank you, Mr. Lamson. Good day. Tell me, Mr. Lamson, as well as your legal knowledge, which comes, I imagine, from a spell in a solicitor's office, did you ever work at the chemical factory here? As a matter of fact, I did. Aha! Come along, Watson. Oh, by the way, what did the general want here just now? I can't see it's any of your business, but he was making arrangements for the funeral of one of the workers on his estate. Oh. Do come along, Watson. What? Oh, uh, yeah, thank you for your help, Mr. Lanson. Um, I appreciate this is a difficult time, Miss Durham, but, but you, you could greatly assist us. I'll tell you what I can, but this gentleman... Madam, I assure you, I am fully in Holmes's confidence. Quite so. Now, what can you offer as an explanation for this killing? It can only be that poor Charles... Charles Sawyer, that is, quite lost his head. He was very persistent in his attentions. He just couldn't accept that I wasn't attracted to him. Why were you attracted to Mr. Gerard? Now, steady on, Holmes. It's all right. I can see the point of the question. But I can only believe Mr. Holmes asks it because he himself has never been in love. Uh, it... <laughs> hmm. One cannot be perfect. <laughs> oh, Mr. Holmes, this is my brother Simon. Holmes? The detective? What's Fowler playing at now? Our visit has nothing We're to do We're here in a private, uh, not a police capacity. And why is that? Uh, Watson? Well... Uh, Dr. Watson uh, hesitates because it's a little unethical to tell you. But I've been engaged by Mr. Gerard's relatives. <laughs> what? Relatives? But I don't understand. I didn't know there were any relatives. No, I'm sure there aren't. Uh, the plural is misleading. It is, in fact, Mr. Gerard's brother. Brother? But he died in South Africa. I have satisfied myself as to his authenticity. That's most odd. His principal concern, as Mr. Gerard's only surviving relative, is, as you might expect, his inheritance. Inheritance? There is, of course, no problem, as there is no will. But he would, in any case, contest one which excluded him. I don't understand. Simon... Mr. Holmes, I shall have to ask you to come back, if you must, some other time. My sister is not yet strong enough for prolonged bouts of questioning. Of course. Well, come along then, Watson. Let us return to the hotel. Then perhaps I can finish the newspaper. You went over the top a bit at Miss Durham's, I thought, Holmes, saying you were representing someone who's dead. I was under the impression you needed extricating. And you rather went on about a will, too, I thought. Fowler said there wasn't one. Hmm, so he did. I don't know, Holmes. This doesn't seem to be making any sense at all. Where there's a will, there's a way. Oh, do stop going on about a will, Holmes. I got caught out in the Baskerville case that way, and it's not going to happen again. Don't you expect our work so far to provoke a reaction? Or such as? Such as the new development just approaching. <coughs> Excuse me, Mr. Holmes. This envelope addressed to you has been found on the reception desk. Ah, thank you. Thank you, sir. Go ahead, Watson. No, decent of you. If you wish to bring your investigations to a swift conclusion, be at 13 Templars Drive at midnight... Why midnight? Because all the honest citizens of Reading are abed by then. Holmes, this could be a trap. It would be unworthy of attention if it were not. You think we should go then? Well, certainly, if we are to have a little excitement to alleviate the boredom. Holmes, do you notice the way the words and letters are cut from a newspaper? Yes, the Reading Evening Post. The Reading? You, you know, it really is time you penned a short monograph on this use of newspaper cuttings to construct anonymous messages. I can think of little that would be more tiresome. Coffee? We've a few hours to kill. Eh, Watson? <sighs> now, at least the rain's held off. Now, none of these houses is occupied. Our man, or woman, has made a good choice. Now, here's 13. No sign of any lights. No, no knocker. Nothing for it but to try the bell, I suppose. Just a moment, Watson. That bell push is not new, but these marks around the edge are. See where the pointing of the brickwork is scratched? Oh, yes. Let us show a little prudence. Does your umbrella have any sentimental value, Watson? Why, no. It's, uh, it's quite new, actually. Splendid. 
I promise you a first-class replacement and a return to London. Holmes, you're not going to throw my umbrella at the bell. The night air hasn't dulled your wits, Watson. At school, I possessed a certain skill with a javelin. Let us see how much of it I still have. This should provide just the necessary confirmation I require. If you ask me, you've had a lucky escape, Mr. Holmes. In our profession, there's no such thing, Inspector. Hmm. Coincidence it should happen while you were there. They found a gas leak in the building. I'm surprised they found the building. Now, since you're out of bed anyway, shall we make a brief call? At this hour? Inspector, if we can bring these interminable proceedings to an end, I can return to London on the next available train. Oh, I hope you know what you're doing. This is a hell of a time to come visiting. Uh, Mr. Holmes has promised me he'll be brief, Mr. Durham. Good. I apologise, Miss Durham. Thank you. Quite so. Now, Inspector, if you have a trained and sensitive nose, the smell of cordite lingers for some time after its use. As Watson found, it was present on the crossbow bolt. And it was present on a tree in the copse above the road where Gerard was killed. That tree had a fork in it where the bark was scraped. The crossbow bolt must have been fired from there, using a specially designed gun, presumably now disposed of. Now, who has sufficient knowledge to construct such a weapon and indeed subsequently to demolish 13 Templars Drive? The General. But you saw for yourself, Watson, when you gave him that little writing test. Those hands trembled too much from age and probably gin to deal safely with the making of a gun or the arming of a detonator. Ah, but then Gerard's partner, Lamson, hence my question about the chemical factory. No, Watson. But what about the motive? You come upon that question somewhat late in the day, if I may say so, Inspector. The lovesick moonings of a young man are much less significant than the presence of a large sum of money. Once Sawyer had been convicted of the crime he did not commit, an authentic will coming to light would arouse little suspicion. But I found no will. That doesn't mean one does not exist. <gasps> Where did that come from? I came upon it in his house, placed there after your search. The general is not a beneficiary... Lamson's interest was in Gerard's death before a will was drawn up. But the principal beneficiary stood to gain a good deal. Did you not, Miss Durham? Mr. Holmes, I beg you... The time for begging, young lady, is past. I put it to you that you were not in love with Gerard, but only led him to believe you were to the point of contracting marriage. What are you... Once Gerard had been fooled into thinking that for once in his life he had attracted a woman, he needed little persuasion to make a will in your favour. Inspector, this farrago has gone on long enough. How could my sister have killed Gerard in the way described? It's nonsense. Yes. I have said nothing about Miss Dullum committing that part of the crime. Once she received the money, she would have been free to marry whom she wanted, the man who put her up to this, <laughs> and who not only murdered Gerard, but attempted the same on Watson and myself. And who would be capable of that? A mining engineer, a man who saw none of that money the last time it changed hands. Gerard's brother. But Peter Gerard's dead. No, Miss Dullum. He faked that, as you well know, since he's standing behind you. Oh, now, look here, I Inspector. I think perhaps we'll hear Mr. Holmes out, Mr. Durham. The passport issued to Peter Gerard stated that he had a red birthmark on the right upper arm. Would you like to demonstrate you do not have such a birthmark, Mr. Durham? I'll be damned if I will. I never heard of it. Aha! The birthmark. Oh, Peter! Take him away. Well, I hope you'll cause us less trouble, Miss Durham. There's no point now, is there? Well, I hadn't expected anything like that, Mr. Holmes, I must say. Ah, but you see, Inspector, crime is common. Logic is rare. Watson, my grandfather said that. But just how did you come to be in the house and find that will? Uh, you, you have your man, Inspector. Don't concern yourself with the trivia. Now, which is the quickest way to the station from here? <laughs> It's good to be back. <coughs> the country is no substitute for the city. Holmes, I can't quite work it out. What made you suspect they weren't brother and sister? The relationship was only stated. One should always require proof. But the reason you checked... Well, the smallest point is enough, Watson. He knew about the supposed death of Gerard's brother. Mm -hmm. And with traces of a tan which could scarcely be attributed to the summers of Berkshire, he was surely worth a little trifling research. <laughs> Now, enough of this doorstep banality about um, crime. Let's go in. I must get on with arranging some flying lessons. They're not so fast, Holmes. You must turn your mind next to preventing any more young girls being molested in Hyde Park. Oh, Watson. No, really, I insist. That
that episode of Second Home starred Peter Egan as Holmes and Jeremy Nicholas as Watson. Inspector Fowler was played by James Carey, The General by Ronald Baddeley, and Lamson by Hugh Dixon, with Maddie Head as Janet Durham and Stuart Organ as Simon Durham. Second Homes was written by Grant Eustace and produced by Paul Mayhew Archer. This video was uploaded to the channel Thinking Out Louder. Please like, comment and subscribe to the Thinking Out Louder channel. Thank you. Second Homes by Grant Eustace, starring Peter Egan as Stamford Holmes and Jeremy Nicholas as Dr. Watson. Episode 4, The Case of the Shadowed Minister. Last, last, good King Winslow, last night out on the feast of Stephen. Got a line, Winslas. squire. Appalling manners people have. Drunk, I suppose. Here, just a minute, Squire. Uh, please get out of my way. I, I, I do not converse with people who skulk in doorways on dark evenings. I only ask for a light, Squire. Don't get shirty. I am not a Squire. Dreadful expression. And uh, anyway, I don't smoke. But as a gentleman, you always carry matches, Watson. Holmes! Not so loud. And move this way. We're very conspicuous by this lamppost. Oh, it gave me quite a start. <laughs> oh, I hadn't expected to find you here. Nor are you. What's that you're carrying? Why, it's a... <laughs> You're joking. Even my limited sense of humour could evolve a better joke than that. No. I can see it's a tree. Well, good heavens, is that all? A tree? I do believe you mean it. Can you deduce nothing else? Ah, uh, you wish to give me a little test, even in this poor light. Ah, very well, hold it up, then. It's a specimen of North Temperate Coniferous genus Pinus, two feet seven inches high. It is sustained an attack by Hylurgus pinaperda, which you may know better as a pine chafer. Sorry, what, what's a pine chafer? Hylurgus pinaperda. Oh. But there's little lasting damage, and it's otherwise healthy. You obtained it from a careless Greek ex-fisherman who smokes a pipe and most probably sells it from a barrow. <laughs> Holmes, you've been following me. Certainly not. I don't want people to talk. But you couldn't possibly deduce all that. The roads are wet and slushy, and this tree has recently been splashed by a passing vehicle. So it was on a stall close to the roadside, not in a shop. Yes. This fragment of ash on the roots from a distinctive and rather unpleasant pipe tobacco favoured by fishermen in the Greek islands. <laughs> You see, I'm always saying you owe it to the world to update your grandfather's monograph on tobacco ash. Yes, you are. Also, it's hardly improbable the man is an ex-fisherman, or he wouldn't be selling trees in the West End of London. That's <laughs> big, big. And now, what about the careless? Oh, you are punctilious in holding the tree upright, but it has been trailed on the ground. You can see where that branch is a trifle bare and muddy, yeah. and the one next to it has had the end broken off. Uh, so it has. You know, from what you say, I think I was grossly overcharged. Damn foreigners are all the same. I don't fancy I've omitted anything of great note. No, apart from the most important, of course. Really? Holmes, this is a Christmas tree. Ah, is that what it is? Christmas, Holmes, the season of peace and goodwill towards men. Clearly a view not universally shared. Oh, really? Oh, you mean you're on a case? Ah, so that's why you're dressed as a tramp. A reasonable deduction. Come on, Watson, there's nothing more to be gained here. Time I went home for a bath and a change of clothes. Yes. Ah, that's better. I rather overdid the smell element of the disguise this time. Yes. Uh, so, what's all this about, Holmes? Now, from that tone of voice, you believe you have the makings of another fat check. Oh. You'll be disappointed. You won't be able to publish this one. Oh. You mean it's pretty sensitive, eh? Royal liaison, perhaps. Something that threatens the fabric of society. Not only do you Danger. write for the Sunday newspapers, Watson, you appear to read them as well. It's nothing so melodramatic. A political scandal, perhaps. Political, yes. Scandal, no. I've been approached by Waterfield. Who? The Minister of State at the Defence Ministry. Aha! 
defense, eh? The national interest at stake. Watson, if you persist in embellishing the story before you even know the facts, I shall say nothing further. Oh, sorry, Holmes. Now, the minister sent me a note to say he believed he was being followed and mm -hmm. asked me to look into it. Oh, that's odd. Not at all. Thanks to you, I have a reputation for dealing with matters of this kind. No, no, I, I, mean, I mean, it's odd he came to you rather than use official channels. Uh, I wonder why. The man is somewhat taciturn. He even managed to compress the whole of his letter to me into 19 words. Unsurprisingly, therefore, he's given me no reason. Well, it must be something personal or sinister. But shortly after the minister's letter arrived, I received this. An anonymous note. Hmm. Mr. Holmes, by now you will have received a letter from a government minister. Ignore it. It can do no good to you or him if you attempt to take the matter any further. Most promising. You think so? Of course. Your antagonist has shown his hand. Uh, there's always a great deal to be deduced from anonymous notes. And such as? The paper. The market leader in domestic writing paper, available at any stationers. Ah. Oh, then the typewriter. The most common electric office typewriter. It would not be unreasonable to suppose there are at least 50,000 of them in London alone. Tracing the one with a slight fault in the lowercase t would be a most tedious undertaking. Uh, well, the, the postmark on the envelope is... Central London. Oh. Well, just a moment. There's something wrong with all this. I found you out in the street already working on the case. Uh -huh. I haven't had to persuade you to take it on. For once, no. So why have you? Since you put me to the test with your much-abused Christmas tree, I think it's only fair that I should return the compliment. Ah, right. Deduce it. Hmm. Uh, the note warns you off. Now, the inevitable reaction to that from a member of the Holmes family would be to make you look into it, <laughs> which you have. Ah! So the writer is not an antagonist, but someone who wants you to take the case. Admirable, Watson. Ah. But incomplete. Oh. Anyone who could reason my first reaction as you have could reason my second. Oh, could they? It is too obvious that a warning note would provoke me to look into a case. It's plausible to assume that the writer of the note intends me to think it is too obvious, and thus not to pursue the case. But you have pursued it. That's because the writer did not wish me to. Ah, I see. You do? But, well, I... Well, it's a trifling little matter. Uh, a pity. This is something genuinely interesting. Oh, really? You've been at your health centre a good deal this week, Watson, so you haven't seen my model. Uh, model? Good grief. Of the west coast of America. Oh, well, I see that sort of model. It really is no good trying to study plate tectonics theoretically. Plate? 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 The mobility of the Earth's surface, Watson. You see, this is the Gorda Plate off Canada, mm. and this is the Cocos Plate off Central America. Mm. The difficulty is that to simulate movement between between them and the North American plate, I need to write a very complicated program for the computer. Uh, you see? Uh, well, I'm nearly there. I knew when you bought that mini computer it would divert you from your true vocation. The nature of my true vocation is something we might differ about. Uh, you would think being X direct you would stop that ringing so often. Holmes? That is correct. Uh, if you must. No, I shall be here. My pleasure. I am too polite. It is not my pleasure. Something new, Holmes? The minister's personal assistant, Alex Messenger, wants to call here urgently. Messenger, eh? <laughs> Pretty appropriate, eh? The winged messenger, mm -hmm. Miss Mercury. Oh, yes. Well, the plot thickens, after all, by the sound of it. I sincerely hope not. But this defence ministry aspect is worrying, don't you think, Holmes? Possibility of involvement by foreign power oh. and so on. Well, good Lord! That Bulgarian case... And which one had you in mind? The assassination. The, the, the man who was stabbed on Waterloo Bridge with an <laughs> umbrella that had a poisoned ball bearing in the The minister tip. is harmless, Watson. Why should the Bulgarians want him eliminated? In any case, if he is to avoid every man in London in December with an umbrella, he'd never get to work. Now, be a good chap and read the newspaper or something. I want to get on with this programming. <laughs> Uh, please do. 49,336. Oh, there's a bit of a problem here, Holmes. Huh? A young lady wants to talk to you, and you're expecting this messenger chap any minute. Ask her in, Watson. Oh, if you think it's all right. Oh, come in, would you, Miss... Uh... Messenger, Watson. What? Dr. Watson, Alex Messenger. Oh, I see. How do you do? How do you do? <laughs> you might have told me, Holmes. Uh, please do sit down, Miss Messenger. Now, have you come to tell me why you wrote the anonymous note? Good Lord. 
You've known all along, I suppose. Well, you do me too much credit. The writer of the note knew I'd received a letter from the minister. Indeed, it seemed to have absorbed some of his cryptic style. Thus, it was logical to believe it came from someone close to him. But I was only certain it was you when I saw the ring on the little finger of your left hand. Ring? It was undoubtedly that which caused the indentations on the paper as you folded it. <laughs> Remarkable. Commonplace. Now, your reason, Miss Messenger? To prevent the minister making a fool of himself. You see, he feels he's going to be moved out in the next ministerial reshuffle. Indeed. So he's been casting around for something that might make him seem more important to the Prime Minister. One of the devices was to say he was being followed. Mm. Very difficult to disprove. Yeah. And at the Defence Ministry, that carries with it all sorts of overtones of his activities being of interest to a foreign power and so on. Mm. Something the PM's very sensitive about, as you know. Oh, what did I tell you, Holmes? Mm. I thought I talked him out of it. And then I found out he'd written to you. So I wrote my note. So that's all cleared up. I can get on with my programming. Good day, Miss Messenger. Not at all, Mr. Holmes. You see, I realised today that the minister is being followed. Yes, I know. Well, you didn't tell me that, Holmes. I don't remember you asking. But, but his life may be at risk after all. I doubt it. Oh. The man followed the minister all day to his office, from his office to the house, to lunch at a busy restaurant. That's when I noticed him, but I didn't see you. Well, that's only to be expected. Then again when the minister was doing his Christmas shopping, which was when we met Watson. Ah, uh, uh, yes. If he wished the minister harm, he had ample opportunity today. I don't think there's anything I need get involved in. You might be able to help me if you did, Mr. Holmes. I should give up that approach, Miss Messenger. Holmes doesn't have a soft side. I beg your pardon? I was it, under the it, impression it was the minister who was being followed but I believe it might be on my account. How do you mean? I think the minister's wife is having her husband followed. Good Lord, why? To prove her suspicions about her husband's personal assistant. Oh, ridiculous. Why should she be jealous of you? <laughs> well, Watson, for a ladies' man, you can be remarkably tactless. Hmm? Well, of course I can see Miss Messenger is um, attractive and quite quite charming mm -hmm. and, um, and, and, and so on. But, I mean, I, I mean it's... It's quite normal to find career women in politics or anywhere else for that matter. But that's the problem. It's not normal to Mrs. Waterfield. Oh. Woman's role is keeping the house and rearing the children while the breadwinner's away. Only since he became a minister, the breadwinner's been away rather too much for her liking. And at the same time, he's got a female personal assistant oh. who clearly can't be trusted if she's 30 and still unmarried. Oh, stuff and nonsense. Of course, you, you may be right about Mrs. Waterfield's old-fashioned views. But I think this business of the minister being followed has a much darker side. It's too much of a coincidence that he's in the defence ministry. Excellent. Oh, you think so, Holmes? I do believe I shall be able to produce an exact replica of the San Andreas Fault. Holmes, we're discussing Miss Messenger's problem. I don't see that she has one. Then could you put my mind at rest? Of course. How? I have to go back to the constituency before the recess. Tomorrow, in fact. Since the minister's asked you to assist, you could come with me. Right. Then you could see whether you feel Mrs. Waterfield is behind this. I still think we'll find another solution. Well, it can't do any harm to start in the constituency. What do you say, Holmes? I'd much rather finish my programming. Please, Mr. Holmes, it's not far, only Norfolk. Well, that's hardly an incentive. The people there take after their county, and the county's desperately flat. You can't dismiss Norfolk like that, Holmes. It's too important to your family. Will we be going anywhere near, near Donnythorpe, uh, Miss Messenger? About ten miles. Ah, there you are, you see. That was the scene of Holmes's grandfather's very first case. Oh, here we go again. Well, anyway, Holmes, we can be there and back in 24 hours. I can promise that. The Waterfield family has a lot of business interests in East Anglia, and I can call on the company aircraft if I need it. Can you now? Aircraft? I'm, I'm sure that's not necessary. But my car's only just down what the road. What sort of aircraft? To be accurate, I should say helicopter. Better still. Helic I, I'm sure there are perfectly good trains. Uh, could the pilot be persuaded to let me sit in the front? I'm sure he could. Uh, well, perhaps we ought to consider whether one of us then should Then off to Norfolk it should be, eh, hey, Watson? Good job my life insurance is up to date. <laughs> a few more minutes before we're there. Thank goodness for that. Not enjoying it, Watson? It's a near certainty this vibration is going to give me vertebrae trouble. <laughs> Are you enjoying it, Mr. Holmes? Very much. Fascinating to see Bernoulli's theorem in practice. Whose theorem? Bernoulli. Distinguished family of Swiss mathematicians. Hello. Something wrong? I think, Watson, you might lean over here and take a look at the pilot. Good Lord, he isn't ill, is he? I noticed he was sweating somewhat, but now he seems to have passed out. What? What? 
Who, who will fly this wretched helicopter, then? At the moment, the autopilot's doing an effective job. Oh, good. But if we're not just to fly around it if we run out of fuel, I shall have to take over. You? I didn't realise you were a pilot. I'm not. Oh, Lord. But the last 40 minutes have been most instructive. It all seems relatively straightforward. Oh, this can't be why. Are you going to be able to bring round the pilot? Not a hope. Look at those pupils. But unless you want to change places with me... Heaven forbid. That's the house up ahead. The helipad's the far side of the terrace. But that's ah. next to the building. Yeah, it might be a fraction ambitious for a first landing. What? We'll try the field instead. Oh, this is hopeless. Mm, it's pretty soggy, I imagine. But I think recovery of the helicopter must take second place to our survival. We're not going to survive. We won't if you keep shouting in my ear, Watson. Now, which direction is the wind? Wind? There's smoke coming from that end chimney. Oh, so there is. Thank you. We need to turn to head into it, then. Now, Miss Messenger, it would be helpful if you would watch the rotor RPM, which is this gauge here. I shall be looking out, and Watson will have his eyes shut. I certainly will. Ignore the numbers, but let me know if the point that goes into the green which is too high, or no, the green which is too low, or the red which is too high. Oh, my God. Well, Mr. Holmes, the pilot usually insists we fasten our seat belts before we land. Then let us follow that good example. Doesn't provide crash helmets, does he? Everybody ready? Switch out the autopilot, then. And down we go. Field. May I introduce Stamford Holmes? You're responsible for this mess, I understand. <laughs> they say they're going to need a crane to move that helicopter. I'm afraid the landing was rather harder than I planned, but I'd assume the cows would disperse as we approached rather than run towards us. Really? Mrs. Waterfield, Dr. Watson and I owe Mr. Holmes our lives. If you hadn't come here, the incident would never have occurred. I'm here at your husband's request. Far be it for me, of course, to interfere with his work. Oh, there you are, Holmes. Mrs. Waterfield, this is Dr. Watson. Uh, looking much better. No, thanks to you. Is the pilot so much better that you can afford to leave him unattended? Uh, he isn't unattended, madam. Your local man has arrived. <clears throat> in fact, the pilot will be all right in a couple of days, but it was a very severe bout of food poisoning. The question is, was it an accident? What? Why should it have been deliberate? The minister might have been travelling with us. In that case, I doubt Miss Messenger would have asked you to come as well. Well, in fact, she did ask Now, all this is come. getting very tiresome, and in any case, it's the minister's business, not mine. So, if you'll excuse me... Mrs. Waterfield, what about accommodation? What about it? Mr. Holmes and Dr. Watson won't be able to get back to London at a reasonable time today, now that the helicopter's out of commission. Well, you should have thought of that before you came all this way. <laughs> I haven't touched the guest room my husband allocated you, of course. But all the other rooms are being prepared for the family coming here over Christmas. It's bad enough to think they're going to look out of the window at that helicopter thing lying there. I can't possibly upset the arrangements for the rooms. Well, I'm sure even in Norfolk there must be somewhere acceptable for Watson and me to stay. There's only the mill house within about half an hour's drive. Then the mill house it is. I don't think you should stay there. Oh, why not? Uh, well, the name Holmes means only one thing. Yes, I should say so. Well, you know what local people are like. They'll draw all the wrong conclusions. I'll go with you. They know me there. In fact, I can stay there as well. well. I don't want to put you to any trouble if you've already got a room here. I'm sure your company is more congenial than mine, Mr. Holmes. Well, After all, you're a man. Well, so I am. No doubt you need a car now to get to there. You'd better take the Range Rover, I suppose. <laughs> To modify my views a little, Miss Messenger. Please call me Alex. Oh, well, if you, if you think so. No, I was saying, I think you may well be right about Mrs. Waterfield's involvement. She hardly hides what she thinks of me. Oh, well, it's just to put us off the scent, I'm sure. Are you? No, it'd be quite possible for a foreign power to have suborned her in some way, and she was rather anxious we shouldn't go to the mill house, wasn't she? Why do you suppose that is? I wouldn't be at all surprised to find some pretty suspicious folk there. It could just be that they don't change their bedding between guests. Oh, good heavens, you don't think so. <laughs> no, 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 I'll vouch for them. It's a simple place. Oh, dear. But it's scrupulously clean. Oh, all right, Prince. Good boy. Yeah, good boy. Down, boy. There, there, there's a good boy. Uh, is that Mrs. Waterfield's? Yes. I thought so. Pretty fierce-looking animal. Only because you're strange. I've often wondered about that, Watson. Really, Holmes? You know what I mean. Here we are. Just as long as Holmes doesn't take over the driving. Oh, those 
unpleasant dogs. You must just bring out the worst in them. Awful lot of them here. Yeah. They breed them. Ah. All right, all right. Calm down. That's it. Good evening, Miss Messenger. It's nice to see you again. But in very unusual company. I wouldn't have expected to see Mr. Holmes out here in the wilds. And how do you know who he is? Michael used to be a policeman. Oh, I see. Yes, yes. I, I was still in the force at the time of that M1 job, when the container of whiskey got hijacked. Ah, yes. Oh, you remember? It's a fascinating case, Miss uh, Alex. Uh, it all hinged on a balding Welshman with one leg longer than the other. Oh, very impressive it was. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, your turning up here must mean trouble for some villain. Oh, well, <laughs> Yes, as a matter of fact. We're just should... giving a little assistance to Miss Messenger. What does a former policeman find to do out here? Oh, uh, look after the dogs. Uh, I was a handler, you see. Oh, <laughs> are they uh, are they as fierce as they sound? <laughs> well, they would be if you provoked them. <laughs> <laughs> I shall do no such thing. <laughs> well, they're mainly excellent guard dogs. Mm -hmm. A lot of mouths to feed. No recent cases of hotel guests disappearing, are there? <laughs> gruesome thought, Holmes. <laughs> uh, with respect, Mr. Holmes, you and Dr. Watson would be a bit too tough for them. <laughs> <laughs> yes, well, that's a comforting thought. <laughs> well, uh, good day to you. All right, yes. <laughs> we can get in through the side door. Oh, nice chap. <laughs> I don't much like his dogs, though. There's no problem, Mrs. Belling. Mrs. Waterfield just doesn't have any rooms free. In a big place like that? Oh, and it is a bit unusual. <sighs> You, a single lady, arriving out of the blue with two gentlemen? Madam, I assure you... But you have all... got some rooms. Well, I think we could find some. But we do usually only take bookings. What is it, Mother? Want rooms. At this time of day? With no bookings. Oh, good Lord. Uh, perhaps it might help if we paid in advance cash. It might help. I thought so. Good. Over to you then, Watson. What? I've only got my credit cards with me. I can't believe they're much use here. Are them nasty plastic things? Well, there. Uh, will that do? Mm, just about. We'll see what we can do. Hmm. That is a bit unusual. Oh, really? Well, that was a good meal. I give them that. The pilot didn't get his food poisoning here. But we'll need to keep our ears open tonight. What for? Something's afoot here, all right. Afoot? Mm. All that about a single lady and two men. Patent nonsense. Do you think so? No, oh, yes, they didn't want us here. And that ties in with Mrs. Waterfield not wanting us to come here. Have you made a reconnaissance of the corridor where our rooms are, Watson? What? You know how important knowing every facet of our surroundings is. By Jove, yes, I'd overlooked that. Well, I must do that at once. Uh, if you'll excuse me, Alex. Well, good night, Watson. Uh, uh, good night. Good night. More coffee? Uh, thank you. If you don't mind, I won't join you. After the way the helicopter flight turned out, I'd like an early night. Uh, Miss Messenger, there are a few occasions when logical methods are unable to penetrate to a significant detail of a case. Uh, this is one. Therefore, I must risk your anger and ask directly, does Mrs. Waterfield's view of you and the minister have any justification? None at all. Thank you. Well, I don't know how I can prove that to you. Well, no need. The truthfulness of an answer is something I've learned to judge. I hope that means you believe me. Well, hope is something we should never be without. Uh, please don't let my enjoyment of your company detain you from your well-deserved rest, Miss Messenger. Alex. Quite so. Good night. Morning, Watson. Oh, bad news, Holmes. I knocked on Alex's door and she's missing from her room. Yes, I know. And that... Oh, do you know where she is? Coming through that clump of trees. What? Morning. Sorry. I hope you haven't been waiting on my account. Not at all. Just that Watson had mistaken your morning run for an abduction. I'll join you at breakfast as soon as I've changed. Oh, extraordinary young woman. There I agree with you, Watson. We've drawn a bit of a blank here. Rather to my surprise, I must say. So, what do we do? Oh, careful, Watson. Yeah, I'm all right. You nearly scratched the Range Rover. Are you sure you're all right? Oh, yes, thanks. Damned leather-soled shoes. Oh. Just a moment. Look, I slipped on this. This 
collects his brake fluid coming from under the Range Rover. Someone's been tampering with these brakes. Well done, Watson. Another attempt on the minister's life. Driving down a hill, the brakes suddenly fail, and he's killed in the accident. With the flat roads of Norfolk, that would be an excruciatingly slow death. But who could have done it? The dogs did nothing in the night time. To the brakes? Excellent, Miss Messenger. What? We heard no barking during the night. Ah, of course. So the dogs knew whoever was prowling out here in the car park. You might just confirm that friend Michael is missing, Watson, now that he's delayed us. I'll see if I can obtain any alternative transport. Mr. Holmes, you really try my patience. First, the helicopter, and now you drive out to my front door in a tractor. I'm afraid it was the only vehicle that even Watson's deep wallet could hire for us. Hmm. Once I'd paid all the hotel bills... And what are you doing back here, anyway? Michael, that dog breeder at Mill House, is missing. What? Since you have one of the same breed of dog, it seems possible you might be able to tell us something about him. Very good, Watson. Thank you, Holmes. But you forgot to mention about Michael blackmailing Mrs. Waterfield. Black what? How did you know that? If you know where to look, it isn't difficult to discover that you had a conviction for shoplifting before your marriage. This is all you're doing. I didn't even know. Alex, uh, uh, Miss Messenger, was not involved. I learned of it from the same police sources as Michael probably used. <sighs> he came here this morning, accusing me of putting you onto him. Eventually, I convinced him I had done nothing of the sort. But then he said he couldn't go back to the mill house anymore, so I had to pay him even more money to get him out of my hair once and for all. And now that's a wasted investment, since you'll tell my husband anyway. I have no intention of revealing something you've managed to keep secret. But what about his political confidant here? I have no interest in hurting the minister. He won't hear about it from me. But do you mean to say that you have nothing to do with a man following the minister? Which man? I told you, Watson, that's not a problem. Yes. But, this uh, is the season for terrorist unpleasantness in London, and the minister's shadow is a special branch man. Not especially competent, since he was never aware that I was following him. But perhaps, fortunately, I have no terrorist inclinations. So you knew before we left London? Of course. Then why did you agree to come here? Well, you offered me a helicopter ride. Well, uh, Now, with that <laughs> method of transport precluded, could someone offer a means of returning to London that is faster than a tractor? Holmes, this is jolly decent of you buying me dinner. Well, you admonish me for neglecting Christmas, Watson, quite rightly. Well, I wouldn't say anymore. So I'm spreading a little seasonal goodwill, and we felt I owed you an apology, too, for not telling you when I knew about the man following the minister. Uh, we... Someone else joining us? No, yeah, just coming, in fact. Hello. Hello. Sorry, I'm always the last to arrive. Good Lord. We can go in and eat, then. Oh, good, I'm starving. They do a very good chateau briand yeah, just, 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 just a minute, Holmes. Yes? You, you, you're apologising to me and taking a lady to dinner. Very astute, Watson. Well, Holmes, are you sure you're feeling all right? Never felt better, Watson. <laughs> That episode of Second Holmes starred Peter Egan as Holmes and Jeremy Nicholas as Watson, with Angela Down as Alex Messenger, Mrs. Waterfield was played by Wendy Murray, Michael by Jim Reed, and Mr. Belling by Stuart Auburn, with Miranda Forbes as Mrs. Belling. Second Holmes was written by Grant Eustace and produced by Paul Mayhew Archer. <laughs> Second Holmes by Grant Eustace, starring Peter Egan as Stanford Holmes and Jeremy Nicholas as Dr. Watson. Episode 5, The Case of the Neglected Farm. Here, the protector of this damned trumpet talks thou to me of gifts. Thou art a traitor. Off with his head. Now, by St. Paul, I swear I will not dine until I see the same. Excuse me, thank you. Oh, here we are, Holmes. Sorry about the delay. Mm. A bit of a scrum at the bar. Cheers. Watson, hmm? 
What about the lemon? Oh, sorry, they run out of that. And the ice? All melted, I'm afraid. It's gone the way of the theatre's air conditioning, I imagine. Mm. And you're not trying to tell me your Saturday night out is being spoiled. Oh, no. Oh, good. But the evening isn't over yet. I thought you wanted to come to the theatre. I did. But my good nature overcame my good sense and allowed you to choose the play. You can't mean you haven't enjoyed it. That was a marvellous first half. Well, the acting was adequate. Well, surely you're not criticising the play. Richard III is one of Shakespeare's greatest histories. We might take issue on the word history. Well, <laughs> bit of poetic license here and there, perhaps. Yes, even more than you take with tales of my exploits. Just like your grandfather and his writing. Holmes, you do exaggerate, and Why sir? the Sunday papers are prepared to publish your stuff, I can't imagine. What? If they didn't publish it, I wouldn't have every ragtag and bobtail believing they only have to recount some preposterous set of circumstances for me to jump at the chance to help them. You provide a necessary service to society. You make me sound like the Department of Health and Social Security, Watson. Oh, really? <laughs> a consulting detective is hardly in the same league as them. Marriage guidance counselor. It might just as well be. The great crimes are a thing of the past. Ah, so you should at least be enjoying Richard the Third. Great crimes, Watson, not petty intrigue. A petty intrigue for the throne of England? Pure opportunism. <laughs> it was hardly well planned since it crumbled away beneath him in two years. What about the murders, Holmes? I spoke of great crime. Antagonizing everyone around you until you have no allies is hardly a mark of criminal greatness. But the play, Holmes, that at least is great. Hmm? It has drama, if not as entirely accurate history. Are we so to suspend disbelief that we accept that an entire court was so witless it didn't notice such transparent villainy before it engulfed them? Now, talking of noticing things, Holmes, I do believe we're being watched. And of course we are. Oh, you noticed as well, did you? That, uh, that swarthy man with the pencil moustache. Now, there's a transparent villain. I don't I saw one. Watson, that is the Venezuelan ambassador. The Venezuelan? Good Lord, is it? Oh, he looks as if he's watching us. That's because he has a glass eye. Oh, well, I'm damned. <laughs> uh, yes, but, but you said we were being watched. I fear there is worse to come. It is Mr. Holmes, isn't it? Yes, and I'm Dr. Watson. Yes, of course you are. My name's Sarah Callington. Oh, Miss Callington, if you just give me your program, I'll happily sign it as long as you go away with it. I don't want your autograph. I want professional assistance. Oh. Uh -huh. I, I just noticed you in the crowd and thought if I spoke to you, well, you might be able to clear up something for me. Oh. As it happens, Holmes isn't at all committed at the moment. Oh, good. Nonsense. For a start, I'm committed tomorrow to a hot air balloon race. <laughs> Come now, Holmes. Was that a joke? <laughs> it runs in Holmes' family. <laughs> a sense of humour that's a bit dry. Almost desiccated. <laughs> Look, why don't we discuss this over a meal after the play? I don't think... I'll pay, of course. No, oh, I wouldn't dream of it. Will be Holmes? Ah, the second half is beginning. Right, then I'll meet you in the foyer afterwards. That was a bit of luck, Holmes. A chance meeting like that leading to a new case. Just don't ask me again if my evening is being spoiled, Watson. Slave, I have set my life upon a cast, and I will stand the hazard of the die. I think there be six witchmen in the field. Five I have slain today instead of him. A horse! A horse! Wake up. My kingdom for the horse! a bottle of 66 Romany Conti. Well, that should do something to salvage my day. Since you approached Holmes on impulse when you saw him, is this something that's just cropped up? No, not really. It's been building up for some time. Watson, perhaps we could just ask Miss Callington to tell us what's on her mind. I thought you liked to deduce all that. You've been reading too many of Watson's stories. <laughs> now, certainly, let's see. Um, well, you're a single lady with uh, good taste in wine. That's obvious. Quite. Uh, a journalist, uh, a squash player, a sufferer from hay fever and left-handed. Not bad. Incredible, Holmes. How did you work that out? Watson, it really is time you deduce these things for yourself. Now, Miss Carrington, could you get to the point, if indeed it's worth getting to? It's about my sister's marriage. Health and social security again. I beg your pardon? Pay no attention. Now, what exactly is the problem? Right. My sister Kate is married to a farmer who lives in Dorset. Mm -hmm. 
Now, since those communities can be pretty insular, I try to write to Kate regularly, keep her in touch with the outside world, and she replies equally regularly. But just lately, her letters sound as if she's not receiving mine. She'd never say so directly. She thinks she was being critical of my not writing. Now, how many letters do you think are involved? Oh, certainly three, possibly four. Oh, there's too many to be accounted for by post office incompetence. And perhaps there's a conspiracy in a Dorset sorting office. Good Lord, yes. We'd better keep that in mind. Mm. I'm a little surprised in this technological age that you rely on the written word. I am aware of the telephone's existence, Mr. Holmes. Weekly, Kate's husband, Tom Woodley, had their phone removed. Uh -huh. To save money. Mm. That's what's behind all this. Money. Mm. In Holmes' experience, it often is. You see, Wiggly marries Kate for her money. Did she have much? Yes and no. That must have confused her. At the time of her marriage, she didn't. But my father was a shipbroker and very successful. It was clear there should be money in time. What did your sister marry for? She said it was for love. An emotion which is a lot to answer for. You can be shockingly cynical at times, Holmes. Love also makes the world go round, you know. Among your strong points, I have never numbered astronomy, Watson. I think you can also blame reading too much Thomas Hardy. She actually liked the idea of going to live on Dorset Farm. Extraordinary. Your sister never realised her love wasn't returned? No. I shouldn't speak ill of the dead, I suppose, but I think my father could have come on a bit stronger with Kate to put her off marrying Wigley. But Mother had died a few years earlier, and he saw his role as being indulgent to us rather than strict. So you survived the experience, though. Some of us have the will to discipline ourselves, Mr. Holmes. Now, you said there should have been money. But since your father has now died, well, that implies that expectations were disappointed. Very good, Watson. <laughs> After the wedding, my father came to his senses a bit when he saw that Wigley wasn't exactly behaving as an ideal husband. Well, in my book, ideal husband is a contradiction in terms, mm -hmm. but, uh, you probably know what my father meant by that. Yes, I should hope so. Considerate, sober, hard-working, gentle to the opposite sex. Wiggly is none of those. Mm -hmm. Very enlightening list of yours, Watson. I hardly qualify for any of those. Does that mean I won't make an ideal husband? Are we discussing your problems or mine? I didn't say I had it a problem. Oh, what him. happened when your father died, Miss Carrington? In his will, he left nearly all his money in trust for Kate's and my children. Are there any? No. Nor likely to be in either case. I've got better things to do with my life, and none have come out of her marriage. What happens to the money in the event that you don't have a change of heart, of course? It goes to cancer research. Mother died of mm. cancer. So, if Wigley's whole purpose for the marriage were frustrated, his behaviour might be expected to get worse. It's exactly what's happened. Mm. They might as well be living apart for the amount of attention he pays, mm. and he doesn't yeah. even bother about his livelihood. Uh, the farm wasn't much to start with, God knows, but it's become really run down. Mm. Now, if he's intercepting her post as well, her life must be getting close to intolerable. Yeah. Yeah. Well, what's your sister's reaction to all this? Hmm? Oh, Kate's on the religious side of the family. Marriage vows were for better, for worse. I think she just sees this as a patch of the worse. Mm, yes. I, I think Mrs. Wiggly deserves our help, don't you, Holmes? Uh, you leave first thing in the morning. Well, you could, Watson. I really don't see how I can disappoint the others in the balloon race. It's been arranged for months. Well, I'd be happy if you'd go down, Doctor. You seem to have some sort of sympathy with what's happening to my sister. Mr. Holmes and the hot air in his balloon are well matched. <laughs> Um, right, I, I shall be on the road to Dorset by seven. Uh, one small question, if I'm allowed. Why is it you're not going to Dorset yourself? Journalism is still dominated by men. I can't afford to do just what they expect and take time off when it suits me. It could damage my career. Anyway, what's the point of earning money if you can't make it do some work for you? Oh, then you'll be getting your petrol paid for, Watson. Somewhere, and that really can't be that bad. <laughs> okay. Yeah. And also that old sign, White Down. The oh, White Down Farm, that's it. <laughs> Last. Oh, heavens. That must be the broken down place up that drive. <laughs> See what Sarah Kennedy means. <laughs> Yeah, dear.
dear, what a state the place is in. Hey, you! Ah, good morning. Is it? Oh, I think so. <laughs> Sun shining, birds singing, and so on. Birds. Wood pigeons, they are destructive little pests. Ah. Shoot them as soon as look at them. Uh, talking of shooting, could you stop pointing that shotgun at me? It's a very bad habit, you know, even if it's not loaded. It's loaded. Oh. And on my land, I'll do what I damn well please. My land, mark you. So why are you trespassing on it? I came to see if the lady of the house was No, nah, and I wasn't, I suppose. You're some sort of sex maniac. Sex? What a preposterous idea. What's that photo? Give that back. What are you doing with a photo of my wife? I, I I got it from her sister. Oh, this is busybody Sarah's work, is it? Well, my wife's not here. And if she was, she wouldn't be seeing you. Got it? Now push off. I thought you couldn't possibly be as black as you were painted. I now see Sarah Carrington wasn't exaggerating at all. What? What are you playing at? The other barrel's loaded, too. And I won't fire that one in the air. Do I make myself clear? Abundantly. <laughs> Sarah's got every reason to be worried about her sister. Good Lord. He said she wasn't there. Suppose he's... Suppose he's done away with her. What a terrible thought. Said he couldn't believe that people can't recognize a transparent villain in their midst. But well, what else is witty but just that? Nobody seems to do anything about it. Yes, I think I. Be... Hello. Ah, the village shop looks open. Good. Ah, perhaps we can get a little local intelligence. Anyone about? It's <laughs> deserted. <laughs> like the rest of the village. Come in. No. Ah. Hello. Wasn't really expecting anyone until church finished. Now, of course. That's where Kate is. <laughs> what are we Kate? Mean? But is that Kate Wigley? You know her. Oh, not really. I have an introduction from her sister. <laughs> you, you couldn't be local. Too well dressed. <laughs> <laughs> well, now, if you have such a keen eye, you might be able to help me. Well. It probably comes from your time in the Navy, doesn't it? Hmm? Who did you know I was in the Navy? <laughs> oh, my dear Mr. Rath. Swanagan. My dear Mr. Swanagan, elementary. You have that distinctively naval fashion of unshaven patches on the cheeks. Oh. I can just see a photograph of a warship on that wall, and Portland Naval Base is just across Weymouth Bay. When you say it like that, you make it sound easy. <laughs> you know, that's what Holmes always says. Holmes? You mean Stamford Holmes? Yes. Funny you should say that. I was just reading a story about him in the Sunday paper. Rattling good read it is, too. Do you think so? Do you really think so? I, I say, Mr. Swanick, you've no idea how gratified I am to make your acquaintance. Well, <laughs> now, uh, what can you tell me of Tom Wigley? He's not a friend of yours. <laughs> Quite the reverse. Then I can be honest. He's a pain in the neck. I see him from four angles, and I don't like him from any of them. Oh? I'm a member of the parish council, and we regularly have something to deal with about White Down Farm. Someone's always got a complaint. Really? As a shopkeeper, I find he's a lousy payer. I won't let him have credit anymore. No, of course not. As a parent, I don't like the way he chases children off his land. Chases uh, children? Yes, and a good deal of it's his fault anyway, since he won't maintain fences. Yeah, yeah. And my wife does a lot of work at the church and knows Kate Wigley. As far as we can gather, Wigley's a pig at home as well. A pig, eh? Mm. It's not a pretty record, is it? I'm afraid not. Only need to find the. He used to be in the RAF, and the picture's complete, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, only joking, of course. I thought. Didn't take you long to find the village gossip. What, you? I knew as soon as you took the road into the village, you were going to need a second talking to. And I hope you're not going to try and throw me off someone else's property now. I may not be a clever Londoner like you and that bitch of a sister, but I'm not simple. 
I'm just making sure you got the message first time. The message I've got is that the people around here are charming, with one exception. Just be warned. And take the message back to Sarah. What Kate and me do is our business and no one else's. So you go fester in your miserable city and leave me be. Good, now that's them coming out of church. Time to take my wife away before you disturb her as much as you are me. You certainly got a bit of an enemy there, Mr... Doctor, uh, Dr. Watson. Well, I'm down. The one I've just been reading. That's right. Are you and Mr. Holmes after all, Wiggly, then? Well, oh, that's great. Uh, it's just me this time. We do work alone occasionally. You'll need a second pair of hands. Just let me know. Oh, thank you, I will. But, um, mum's the word about my being in the village. All right. You said it, Dr. Watson. <laughs> Excuse me. Uh, yes? Uh, is your name by any chance Dr. Watson? Oh, yes, it is, Vicar. But just, how do you know my name? Swanick hasn't been out here. Mr. Swanick? No, no, I... I was oh, of course, the most infallible disguise. No one suspects a parson. I think you'll pardon. Oh, come off it, Holmes. Admit I've got the better of you for once. I see through your disguise. I don't <laughs> understand. A complete with false massage, too. Come on, Holmes. Let's get rid of that for a start. <laughs> Oh, oh, good Lord, it's real. I'm frankly sorry. I'm surrounded by magic. Oh, it's entirely my fault. I, I, I was convinced it was in, in someone else pretending to be you, you see. To be me? To be, uh, uh, well, a vicar anyway. Uh, terribly embarrassing. I hope there are only two of you. Two? Who's the other one? The one who put ten pounds in the restoration fund box. But that's a divine kind of madness, Mark. Now, what did he do that for? In return for me coming out to tell you to meet him at the top of the church tower. So you see, he's a bit touched too. La, ah, that must be Holmes. Was it a rather narrow-faced man with piercing blue eyes and an educated air about him? No. Oh. No, rather full in the face with bushy eyebrows and a local accent. Ah. That's the door to the tower over there. Local, eh? One of Wiggly's cronies, no doubt. I'll soon sort that out. <sighs> I don't go to meet the likes of them without some weapon. <laughs> Up there. Yes, sir. Stand away from the stair. I'm coming up. Right oh, sir. I'm over by the power pack. Good. I warn you that I am armed. Now, what's this about? Alphabet, please don't poke me with that stick, Watson. What? It might spoil my makeup. <laughs> It is really you this time. It is. I fear that after your assault on the vicar, I may have to slip some more money in the church box. Would you be good enough to explain? Why did you say that you were going balloon racing when in fact you come here? Among your many talents, Watson, dissimulation finds no place. Mm. If I had arranged with you to lure Wiggly out of his house, it would never have worked. As it was, knowing of no subterfuge, you succeeded brilliantly. You've been inside the farm, then? Of course. Immediately, Wiggly drove after you. And now I know we have more here than just an incompatible married couple. I didn't think this case interested you at all. There is a flaw in the logic. A farmer who puts farm before wife is quite plausible. Mm -hmm. And a farm which falls in hard times due to poor weather or crop disease or a fickle market would not be surprising. But here we have a farmer who neglects both wife and farm. He, not outside forces, runs it down, yet he's a greedy man, and the farm is his only source of income. Hmm. It doesn't add up, does it? It doesn't seem to, yeah. but of course it must. And as usual, the very point which appears to complicate a case is, in fact, the one which is most likely to elucidate it. But why do you need to be in disguise? Well, thanks to your literary efforts, I'm rather too well known. Wiggly is a temperamental man. I'm not sure what his reaction might be if I put an appearance in the Dorset countryside. He has a scheme afoot. Ah, a great crime after all. <laughs> Shades of Richard III, eh? No. Oh. The prize is great, but it's a grubby little scheme which we must observe closely. That's why I'm up here. It's the nearest we can get to the farm and remain concealed. 
had a pair of field glasses and we're in business. But what is the scheme, Holmes? I believe what Wiggy has been doing is trying to provoke his wife into divorcing him. Uh-huh. He may now have realized that her beliefs won't let her entertain the idea. You mean her religious sort? Quite. Since he wants that freedom soon, she may now be in some danger of a more permanent method of divorce. You mean... Well, if that's the case, we can't just stand here. At the moment, we have no alternative. We would be repelled by that shotgun if we tried the direct approach. <laughs> yes, but I took the precaution of leaving a small transmitting microphone in their living room. Good Lord. The receiver is here. So if you'll be good enough to put on these earphones and take the field glasses, you can carry on with the watch. And what are you going to do? It's time I took the vicar into our confidence about one of his flock. We're in luck, Watson. What did you say? The earphones. Hmm? Take off the earphones. Mm? Oh, yes. Extraordinary things going on at the farm. What do you mean? I wouldn't have believed that two people could live in the same building and exchange so few words. But you are still hearing Kate Wigley's voice. Oh, yes. Good. The vicar tells me she always attends Evensong. Wigley would hardly do anything when her absence would be so immediately noticed. And it gives me an opportunity to talk to her without the hazard of Wiggly's finger on a trigger. But don't you see, Mrs. Wiggly, Mr. Holmes makes a persuasive case for there being some risk for you at home. I know Tom often has fits of temper, and he does have a rough tone, more than I would wish, perhaps. But whatever he's threatened, he's never hurt me. I have a good deal of experience of the bleaker side of human nature, Mrs. Wiggly. People will do the most surprising things if the stakes are high enough, as I believe they are in this instance. But can't you tell me what that means? Uh, your husband has been at great pains to hide certain facts from you. I'm sure it would only provoke his anger further if you attempted to discuss them with him. I wouldn't do that. Once you knew, you wouldn't be able to stop yourself. Yes, but... I would rather not have the responsibility of telling you before you're prepared to leave the house. Mr. Holmes, I have my duty to do as a Christian wife. Oh, dear. He needs me to support him, not desert him. Mr. Holmes isn't advocating desertion, just suggesting a few days away. Uh, visit your sister, perhaps. No. I realize you're acting from the best possible motives. But I know my duty. I'll stay where I belong. Oh, dear child. I admire your sense of duty, Mrs. Wigley, but I regret it is stronger than your sense of survival. I must be going now. He'll be coming to pick me up. Well, let me walk you as far as the road. Well, I'm not sure, really. My turn to take over, Watson. Holmes, you're bleeding. How did you cut your lip? I met Wiggly. Oh, I see. He'd come to fetch his wife from church, in case she met you, presumably, mm, yeah. and he found her in the street shaking my hand. He was not amused. No. He's even less so now. As he drove off, he looked daggers at me. Out of the only eye he could still see with. <laughs> but uh, did he realize who you were? No, I put on my best dorset. Said I was a new arrival and just met Kate in church. Good. He said he suspected my motives and would put me in my place. Really? It turned out rather the other way round. <laughs> I can only hope that Kate heard enough of my alibi to keep the truth from him. I saw Wigley drive from the farm, of course, but just after that, I thought I also saw some movement in the woods oh. over there. Let's have the glasses. Mm. Ah, it must be uh, couples in Dorset who are on better terms than the Wigglies, eh, Holmes? <laughs> <laughs> the woods are traditional places for courting. Now, let us plan our night's vigil. I suggest you take a break down in the pub now and bring some food back for me. Then we'll split the rest of the night in three-hour turns. How does that sound? I think it'll sound better when I've had a pint of beer. Yeah, don't drink too much, Watson. There are obvious drawbacks to that up here. Hmm? Yeah, oh, good Lord, sir, there are. <laughs> Better just be a half, then. Pity. <laughs> Aha, some movement at last. Watson? Watson? Mm. Oh, Come on, Watson, we're off. Oh, uh, oh what a splendid morning. It won't stay that way unless we hurry. What, uh, something happened? Yes. Why does the farmer go out at first light with his uh, gun? There's a shoot, I imagine. Then why does he need to take his uh, wife with him? Good Lord. Come on, Watson. Right. Mm. This is where they went into the woods. Ah! Oh, don't say we're too late. I think not. That was a man's voice. Ah! Look, there's Kate Wiggly. Shall I go after her, Holmes? I doubt she'll go further than the farm. Let's see first what frightened her like that. Oh, heavens, man. Oh, that frightens 
on me. Let's concentrate on the deductions, Watson. Dear me. Yes. Right. Uh, Wrigley stepped into the animal trap, and the pain made him drop the shotgun. When it hit the ground, it went off accidentally, and... Well... And spread a good deal of Wiggly around the clearing. Yes. Of course, if we didn't know Kate's nature, she could have shot him when she found him trapped. Very good, Watson. But then so could anyone else who was here. What? But no one else was here. Were they? You can come out now, oh. Miss Callington. Good Lord. It wasn't the courting couple you saw last night in the woods, Watson. You don't mean to say she killed Wiggly. No. Merely that she could have. Couldn't you, Miss Callington? Especially as you moved the trap, so it was where Wiggly wasn't expecting it. I certainly did. I nearly walked into it myself last night. But I didn't pull the trigger, and neither did Kate. And I see no benefit in the two of you being cross-examined on that point in court. I think you'd better report accidental death, Watson. Me? You're a doctor, and you found the body. And I'm not here. Remember? Mm. Why did you come, Mr. Holmes? To see why you were lying, young lady. If you wish me to believe in a chance encounter, you should not follow us for the previous 24 hours looking for an opportunity to pretend that. Oh, well, I never noticed. And then you settled much too readily for Watson if you'd really wanted me to investigate. I didn't know what I might have to do down here, you see. I thought it would be a useful cover to have someone well-known working for me, and then no one would suspect that I was here as well. <laughs> In future, choose someone more gullible when you're constructing an alibi. We're not that easily fooled, you know. Quite so. Now, I suggest, Miss Callington, you take this good physician and give your sister some comfort. But let me also direct your attention to a locked desk in the gun room. Mm -hmm. You will find there a survey report on the oil field lying beneath this farmland mm -hmm. and the correspondence from the increasingly agitated oil company wishing to purchase this farm. Oil, eh? So Wigley wanted to prevent a sale until he was divorced, so that he wouldn't have to share the purchase money. Her money is an understatement, Watson. King's ransom would be more appropriate. That much, eh? That much. You see, having failed to get a penny of her money, Wigley wanted to make sure she got none of his. My God. And the oil company was pressing him for a decision by the end of the month. Now off you go and look after poor Kate. Well, actually, rich Kate now. <laughs> and where are you going? To Bournemouth. Oh, a new case, eh? No. If I get there before nine, I can pick up the second leg of the balloon, balloon race. race. Oh, dear. That episode of Second Home starred Peter Egan as Holmes and Jeremy Nicholas as Watson, with Fiona Walker as Sarah Callington. Tom Wigley was played by Steve Hodgson, Bob Swanick by Ronald Baddeley, and The Vicar by Hugh Dixon with Alexandra Matthey as Kate Wigley. Second Homes is written by Grant Eustace and produced by Paul Mayhew Archer. Second Homes by Grant Eustace, starring Peter Egan as Stamford Holmes and Jeremy Nicholas as Dr. Watson. Episode 6, The Case of the Missing Link. Music there from John Addison. Just a reminder that you're listening to The John Dunn Show. My after seven guest this evening is the detective Stamford Holmes. Now, you were saying a bit earlier on, Mr. Holmes, that you don't think there's a future for detectives like yourself. Why on earth not? Modern police equipment does everything for you. I've been replaced by the silicon chip. It's really Watson <laughs> who gets most of the pleasure out of it. But what about villains? I mean, they're still around. Admittedly, maybe they're not the glamorous men like Moriarty. Well, I don't think my grandfather found Moriarty very glamorous. Uh, but I know what you mean. Uh, that's one of the reasons why detection doesn't appeal. Why did you go in for it, then? Well, I have to provide Dr. Watson with some interesting material for his stories. Well, I hope you go on doing just that, if only because I enjoy reading Dr. Watson's accounts of them. Do you really? <laughs> well, well, he'll be delighted. Thank you very much indeed for joining us. My pleasure. So if anyone listening has any queries or problems, address them, please, not to me, but to Mr. Stanford Holmes. Well, music now from a group that has perhaps rather unhappy associations for you. It's the police. 
and every little thing she does is magic. Thanks very much indeed, Mr. Holmes. I think that went very well. well I hope it won't depress your listening figures too much. <laughs> Not at all, I'm sure. Would you like some more coffee, by the way? Uh, if you're referring to that beverage in the melting cup... Oh, uh, well, there's always the canteen, you know. Oh, thank you, but I have some more work to do at home. Were you aware there's a cufflink under your chair? Oh, so there is. Not yours, I take it. Well, the owner is a bachelor, but he's right-handed, a keen gardener, and suffers from dandruff. He may also be rather stout. <laughs> Watson hasn't been here, has he? No, Jimmy Young's been in here before me. <laughs> <laughs> well, that may help you to trace him. Good evening to you, Mr. Dunn. Watson, so you are here. Hi, Holmes. You're so quiet, I thought you must have gone on your rounds. Well, I've got a clear day today. I must make some proper coffee to wash the taste of that BBC stuff out of my mouth. Well, there's some brewing. It shouldn't be too long. Fresh coffee being made and a used cup beside you already. That's hardly a great feat to deduce that something of importance is on your mind. And the remains of a cigarette you haven't smoked since you gave up playing rugby, and that's years ago. Oh, come on, Holmes. I'm not that old. Am I? Uh, perhaps not that old. But why this depression? All the normal sources of concern to you are in order, as far as I know. Your car is on the road, for once. Your weakness for the lottery of horse racing has you in credit for a change. You haven't worried about being overweight for at least a fortnight. Am I the marrying kind, Holmes? Ah, so that's it. I'd better sit down. You see... You put your finger on it just now. Mm? I'm not as young as I might be. Well, my dear Watson, if we're to believe the saying life begins at 40, you've not even been born yet. I know, but I'm already pretty set in my ways. Marriage would mean a lot of changes. Well, if you can survive sharing accommodation with me, I would have thought wedlock would be child's play. Uh, it's not the domestic arrangements that worry me. I still wash my own socks. Mm, that would be a generous gesture. It's whether I'm fit for it emotionally. Ah. The fact of, of being tied down and... Uh, good Lord, children. Mm, yes, well, now you are in deep waters, Watson. Well, far be it from me to advise a doctor. The only area into which I would presume to enter is the choice of a partner. Now, you're not going to tell me again women are never to be entirely trusted, not even the uh, best of I them. won't say it again, but the caution mm. stands. I assure you the most winning woman I ever knew is still in Holloway for disposing of two husbands for their insurance money. I wouldn't have brought the subject up, Holmes, if I'd thought you weren't going to take it seriously. You don't expect me to believe that sort of thing about Jane. Ah, so it is that stewardess Jane Mapleton you plan to propose to. No, for once you're wrong, Holmes. Really? Another Jane? Uh, no, no, it's, it's Jane Mapleton, all right. Oh. But oh. the proposal's already been made. How very impetuous of you. As it happens, she proposed to me. Oh, <laughs> well, these are liberated times. I suppose it's only to be expected. She should be an excellent companion, given my general reservations about the female sex. Oh, so you're, you're, you're not going to argue against it? Oh, why should I? Miss Mapleton has a strong blend of logical thinking and feminine intuition. Yes, she has. You should get on famously together. You might even set up business as consulting detectives. <laughs> what, in competition with you? <laughs> Nonsense. No, you'd have the field clear. What? Without you living here to nag me every minute, I would finally be relieved of the stultifying task of following in my family's footsteps. Great Scott, that hadn't occurred to me. What a terrible thought. I could get on with some really interesting things for a change. Well, that the whole business in a completely different light. So, that's settled. Congratulations, Watson. Now, it really is time I had coffee. Oh, I think I need a brandy now. That's better. Right, I'll get on with some work. What passing fancy has seduced you away from your true vocation this time? But nothing less than the nature of matter, Watson. Uh. Recent experiments suggest that subatomic particles exist only when they're being observed. And since everyday objects, like your chair, are made up of subatomic particles... I suppose this chair only exists because I'm observing it, or rather sitting on it. Well, that is the logical extension of this part of quantum physics. Amusing, isn't it? I've never heard anything so illogical in my life. But just think, that might even mean that you and the chair would disappear if I stopped observing you. Now, Holmes, as your friend, as well as your doctor, I feel you might be overdoing this research. Uh, you'll say, Nick, that the doorbell hasn't rung. And I certainly wish it hadn't. I'm not expecting anyone. Uh, oh, yes, I'm sorry, I forgot to tell you. Uh, Mr McPherson rang while you were at the BBC. Uh, since you haven't got any cases at the moment, I told him to call round. Oh. I'll see him now. So I must speak to Jane Mapleton. 
and encourage her to pursue her suit with the utmost vigour. Here we are. This is Mr. McPherson, Holmes. I'm most grateful, Mr. Holmes, for you seeing me at such short notice. <laughs> it's all Dr. Watson's doing, I assure you. <laughs> so, how could Holmes help? Uh, it's, it's only a little matter, really. It can't oh. be so little if it brings you all the way from Edinburgh. <sighs> My goodness. People don't exaggerate about your powers, Mr. Holmes. Uh, the accent is one of the more readily identifiable in the United Kingdom. Thank you, Watson. Of course, I didn't come from Scotland to see you without making an appointment. Think of the waste of money if you hadn't been in. Quite. N no. I was in London on other business when I found myself in Baker Street. Ah. I hardly need to explain to you why your name immediately sprang to mind. Although I thought I'd heard somewhere that you didn't live there anymore. Uh, no. Uh, 221B was pulled down several years ago. Great shame. Not at all. It was hopelessly cramped and getting intolerably noisy. Uh, now, I don't want to go into all that again, Holmes. Uh, go on, Mr. McPherson. Uh, thank you. So, I, I thought perhaps Mr. Holmes would be the one to help poor Mrs. Brady. I asked a policeman where you lived and... Uh, uh, Mr. He... McPherson, uh, perhaps we could start at some logical point. We, we seem rather to, to have begun in the middle. Oh, of course. <laughs> now, let me see. Uh, am I a logical point, I wonder? Ah, well. <laughs> I, I, I think so. Yes. Uh, I am a partner in McElvey, McPherson and Johnson, solicitors. Oh, I thought I brought my card with me, but I seem to have mislaid it. Oh, not to worry. Is your office in the centre of Edinburgh? Yes, in George Street. Yes, I know. Off Prince's Street. Nice part. Uh, so, what's the, the problem with Mrs... Uh, uh, Mrs. Bridie. Mrs. Bridie. Uh, yes, poor dear. Someone's really got it in for her. In what way? Oh, in a very mysterious way. Oh? You see... She lives in a good neighbourhood. You wouldn't normally expect trouble there with young hooligans. And anyway, not at two or three in the morning. But that's when she gets woken once or twice a week by panes of glass smashing, the sound of nails being hammered into the door, that sort of thing. If it happens as often as that, surely the police could put a watch on the house. Uh, they could, Dr. Watson, but they're not prepared to. <laughs> Typical. Uh, you see, whenever she calls them, there's no trace of any damage. Whatever she's heard... There's never anything to be seen. Extraordinary. How old is the lady? Ah, well, now, you see, Mr. Holmes, uh, that's the way the police think. She's in her mid-seventies. But I've known her as a client for years now. Her brain is as sound as a bell. I'd swear to that. Does the house have a history of being haunted? You don't believe in the supernatural, do you, Dr. Watson? <laughs> Good Lord, no. <laughs> no, I, I, just, I just thought... Um, Perhaps someone was making use of some legend or other. Holmes has some experience of that sort of incident. Uh, well, of course. I've read all your grandfather's books, Doctor. Oh, have you? It's not surprising the Baskerville case comes to your mind. Totally predictable, in fact. Uh, but no, there's nothing of the sort. There's no reason to it at all that I can ascertain. But it still goes on. And it seemed to me this morning that this is just the sort of unusual case that could interest you, Mr. Holmes. How right you are, Mr. McPherson. Oh, I'm so glad. Look, I'll write down Mrs. Bride's address for you. She has no telephone, poor dear. Doesn't hold with them. And I'll get one of my colleagues to call by and tell her you'll be coming. Uh, could it be soon? As soon as we can make it. Oh, excellent, excellent. You take a load off my mind. Let me help you on with your coat. Oh, that's most kind. I'll see you to the door. Oh, there's no need. No, there's no trouble. Goodbye, Mr. Holmes. And thank you. Goodbye, Mr. McPherson. Oh, that's a bit of luck, Holmes, eh? A case appearing out of the blue like that. Uh, not that it'll take very long to sort out. It's very clear-cut, isn't it? It's certainly clear-cut, but not in the way you suggest. Ah, you think Mrs. Bridie is actually going a bit gaga? I would wager Mrs. Bridie does not even exist. What? Begin with the so-called Mr. McPherson's first approach. He rang up. Precisely. And since my number is ex-directory, people who ring get the telephone number from someone who really knows it. No, you're from the police. He said he asked a policeman. He asked a policeman where I lived. That still would not get him an ex-directory number from directory inquiries. Ah. And then there is the matter of the accent. I deduced. That's how you said he came from Edinburgh. But if you listened to him instead of me, you might have noticed that certain inflections were not quite correct. Oh. It was a simulated Edinburgh accent, not a real one. Good Lord. And even allowing for genuine absent-mindedness with the card, there was the little matter of his office address. But there is a George Street in Edinburgh, isn't there? There is. But it's not off Prince's Street. It runs parallel to it. A tiny point that one a local might be expected to correct. Quite simply, I believe Mr. Macpherson is a fraud. But then why on earth spin such an odd tale? Ah, deduce it. Ah, right. Well, um, 
there are two possible courses of action for you to take. You either go to Edinburgh, because you can't telephone Mrs. Briley, nice touch that, so you would only find she doesn't exist once you got there. Or you stay here because you see through Macpherson's performance. So, you are either in Edinburgh or London. So, effectively, you can't be in some third place, probably equidistant from both Edinburgh and London, where some grand criminal design is about to be executed. So, halfway between here and there is Yorkshire. So, somewhere in Yorkshire... Watson, uh, your best friends would hardly call you a schemer. Your plot is too straightforward. Straightforward? That? For, for someone to go to all this trouble, there is something more devious behind it. Well, then, surely we should go after this man Macpherson at once. I'm considering that. If it proves necessary, we can follow the homing device I slipped into his pocket when I was helping him on with his coat. I didn't see you do that. And that's only to be expected. We may follow him in due course anyway, purely for the purposes of research, since I've had no opportunity to test the homer since I made it. You made it? Good Lord. <laughs> I don't work on the frontiers of science all the time, Watson. Uh, no, 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 I see that. So what's our next move? I can't speak for you, but I shall have another cup of coffee. Uh, but Holmes... <laughs> can't just sit there. Well, I see no reason why not. Macpherson's visit was clearly meant to provoke. It is logical, therefore, that I should not be provoked. But Holmes... Uh, oh. oh, not someone else you haven't told me about. No. Oh, perhaps it's Macpherson back again. I doubt it. Whatever he came for is done. It's the police, Holmes. Oh. Inspector Winter. Anti-terrorist squad, Mr. Holmes. I admit I do what I can to terrorise my neighbour's remarkably unpleasant dog, but I trust you haven't come to arrest me for that. Oh, I came to see if you can give us some help. Oh, help, very gratifying. I can't imagine that I can achieve what your specialists and computers cannot. To be frank, sir, that's what I told my boss. I've always found frankness an endearing habit, but it does have its limitations. As far as I didn't intend to give Yes, perhaps you could tell us how Holmes can help. Is it safe to talk in front of Dr. Watson? <laughs> well, really? You talk in front of him, Inspector, or you don't talk at all. He is an indispensable part of any investigation. Oh, good Lord. Thank you, Holmes. Don't mention it, Watson. All right, then. Well, you'll have heard of the terrorists they call the Jackal, who invariably seems to turn up anywhere there's trouble. Mm -hmm. Well, over the last couple of years, we've had clear indications that there's actually a second terrorist around of the same, if I can use the word, same quality. Not one person with a new disguise. Well, we thought that too, at first, but we know differently now. Ah. The second one specialises not only in striking against public figures, but against people whose death might be expected to cause political trouble or even instability. There's reason to believe, for example, that he may have had some involvement in President Sadat's case. Good heavens! Have you any idea who he is? Mm, no name. We're fairly certain he's an Englishman who's been living abroad for some time. Uh, this is all very enlightening, Inspector, but why does it bring you to me? Because we believe this man to be on his way to England. May even already be in this country. And I don't imagine he's visiting relatives. Well, I hardly think he'd visit us. That's not why I'm here. Mr. Holmes has contacts which we may not have. He certainly has some unorthodox ways of finding out things. <laughs> Since we have no leads at all, the boss thought that nothing would be lost, asking Mr. Holmes if he could give us anything to go on. But uh, if you can't, I won't waste any more uh, of your don't time. Don't jump to hasty conclusions, Inspector. Let us explore all the possibilities. How does this man work? That's one of the problems. As far as we know, he's never used the same method twice. Hmm. If he really was involved in Egypt, he got others there to stage the military assault. Oh, got evidence in other attacks of a high-powered rifle, poisoning, electrocution, asphyxiation, and a faked car accident. A pretty gruesome list. With one conspicuous omission. You mean explosives? I do. That's what worries us. Our society is too open. I mean, it's virtually impossible to offer protection to public figures against these sort of people. Uh, would you rather we had some other sort of society? Uh, you don't catch me out with a question like that, Mr. Yeah, Holmes. He's right, Holmes. It is very difficult to stop these people in Britain. The Israeli ambassador had an armed guard, but he still got shot. You don't have to remind us of our shortcomings, Doctor, thank you. Oh. The only real solution is to flush them out of wherever they're hiding before they do anything. And I just thought you might have had some stray piece of information which would link up with what we know. Which doesn't seem to be very much. Is there nothing else you can say about what this man has done that might mark him out from others? Not unless you see anything special in the attention to detail in his work. Go on. 
Well, every trace that any police force has ever picked up shows the same meticulous planning. Almost mathematical precision. Mathematical? Oh, what a fool I've been. Oh, what do you mean, Holmes? Do you have a description of this man? I brought the computer printout with me. These are the only common elements in reports. Tall, about six foot three, mm -hmm. slight build, clean shaven. Dark, dark blue eyes, eyes thinning, thinning hair, hair, and a gold tooth. You know him? That could be a description of Macpherson. Who's he? Well, the solicitor who called here just now. Solicitor? You see now why I said he was a fraud, Watson. One item missing from your list is the artificial left kneecap, which was the result of a cycling accident as a child. What, of this Macpherson man? Of Edward Moriarty. Moriarty? You, you don't mean... There is only one Moriarty family likely to concern itself with me, Watson. Which Moriarty is this now? Oh, really, Inspector? You've never heard of the greatest criminal who ever lived? Only criminals who are alive concern me. But his descendants might be, Inspector. The professor to whom Dr. Watson was referring had a son, but then the line died out. Mm. One of the professor's two brothers, Colonel Moriarty, didn't marry, but the youngest of the three had several children, as they did in their turn. Edward Moriarty is one of them seemingly the only one to have inherited any of the criminal strains in his great uncle. So I was under the impression he died of Legionnaire's disease, but that now has all the hallmarks of a planted piece of information, since he was sitting not a half an hour ago in your chair. You think the man we want was here in this room? You have a lightning grasp of the situation, Inspector. The nerve of it, to breeze in as bold as brass like that. The family characteristic, Watson. But why did he come here? Yes, Holmes, that, that's bothering me too. He's got a family score to settle. Now, since we didn't recognise him, he could he could have well, he could have shot us both or something. Therefore, there is a reason why he did not. Which is, we must assume he has not yet committed the crime for which he came. Otherwise, we would have heard of it. He's a businessman and therefore has no wish to start a hue and cry before he's fulfilled his main contract, whatever that may be. Well, then why come here at all? Because he's planning to kill two birds with one stone, or indeed, as seems likely, a bomb. But to do that. He must think you can work out who his real target is. Quite. A, a stimulating challenge. <clears throat> Maybe that to you, but there's a damn sight more at stake. Do you think you know what this man Moriarty is up to? Apart from what you've told me, no. But quite clearly he expects me to be able to find the link now that I know who he is. Hmm. Any ideas, Watson? Uh, you're afraid not. Yeah. I didn't even know the wretched man existed until just now. There's very little documented about that side of the Moriarty family. The grandfather was a station master. Excellent, Watts. At times, there is no one to surpass uh, you. Really? Let us twine three strands together, Inspector. The select group of public figures who might be targets, the likely use of a bomb, and railways. Does anything result? The royal train goes to Sandringham tomorrow. Good heaven! It all fits, does it not? But how does that get you in? He will expect that once a bomb is found, my natural arrogance will make me volunteer to defuse it, knowing that a Moriarty has planted it. Hmm, it is probably right. But he'll booby-trap it. Of course he will. But if the, if the bomb goes up with you defusing it, how will he assassinate anyone else? Quite so. What? Well, you're sparkling this morning, Watson. Oh. <laughs> there will have to be a second bomb, much less obviously placed. Can I use your phone to get the search underway? Please do. I'll just write down the number of the telephone in my car, and you can let us know how you get on. Where are you off to? To see how well I design and build homing devices. Don't you, uh, don't you think he might be having the house watched, Holmes? Most likely, but we have to take that chance. Mm. We will not, however, take a chance with the car. Look underneath it, will you, while I look round the engine. Right. But I thought you said he, he wouldn't have a go at you before he'd done the other job. I believe so. But it would be foolish to rely on it. Oh, quite. See anything? Nothing at all. Nor here. All right, let's get in. Now, let's see. Why do we need a transistor radio? It was the only casing I had to hand when I was making the receiver. Now. Aha, weak but still there, good. You hold that, Watson. Right. Now, we'll see if we missed anything wired up to the car. Holmes, just in case. I, I'd like to say it's been an honour working with you. Thank you, Watson. Perhaps we'll find there's a need for a consulting detective in whatever world we're destined for. Here we go, then. Right. Oh, oh that's a relief. Wings wouldn't have suited either of us, Watson. <laughs> Any way of 
judging distance with this bleeper, Holmes? No, only direction. Yeah. The speed at which it's getting louder suggests he's stationary. This is familiar country, eh? Isha and now Oxshot. <laughs> We're not far from Wisteria Lodge, you know. Yes, I know. That was a grotesque business that our grandparents had to look into down here. Yes. With that man Garcia being lured into a trap. What the... Did you see something? You get better and better, Watson. Good Lord, do I? Yes, you said trap. Mm. Moriarty has arranged it so that I head north for East Anglia where he's placed the bombs. But if he's found the homing device, he will realise I could well come south directly after him, as we're doing. So if he's decided to bait a trap for us... Oh, I see. How would he know we were here? He would recognise us. Not at first. He would recognise the car. Yes. We need another car at once. Over there, at the petrol station. Come on, bring the receiver. You mean you're just going to leave the Ferrari here? It's in short. Come on, Watson. Yes, but... Uh... George, can we get into Isha? Oh. You're not George. Uh, no, madam, I am not. Excuse us, madam. I'm terribly I'm sorry. George! Please keep calm, but, madam. Uh, madam, I assure you there's a simple explanation. But we haven't much money. Really, we we're not going to hold you to ransom. Oh, you've got something worse on your mind. No, Watson always looks like oh, that. Really, Holmes. Madam, I George. assure you. Good Lord. You think you're Stanford Holmes and Dr. Watson. You're escaped lunatics. Madam, we are Stanford Holmes and Dr. Watson. I knew it. Lunatics. How many more times? That home is getting pretty loud, Watson. Yes. George will call the police, you know. He'll come after us. That seems the logical course of action. Perhaps you'd like to talk about it. Oh. I'm a mother. You can talk to me. I have a mother of my own, thank you, madam. That continuous note means we're passing him, Watson. Yes. We'll pull up quietly around the next bend and double back through the woods. Right. We don't want this good lady shot. Oh, master. No, don't Helen. worry, madam. There's no question of that. There he is, Watson. Just as I thought, lying, watching the road. That's not McPherson. No, he's got someone else to do his dirty work. Typical of a Moriarty. So he's escaped. This time, no. I don't like the look of the submachine gun that man's got. Well, thank God you decided to change cars. Yeah. Hand me that piece of branch, will you? What the... Oh. Well done, Holmes. He's out cold. Yes, and here's my Homer in his pocket. This Moriarty's every bit as tricky as his great uncle. Ah, and that sounds like husband George with the police. Good, they can find out for us how much success Inspector Winter has had. Yeah, just like you said, Mr. Holmes. The big bomb was well hidden. It took hours and a metal detector to find it. But it's safe now. And that's the first one we found, over there. Ah, Holmes, you're not going to have a go at it, are you? Of course. Oh, Lord. It was intended for me. Yes, but... I imagine it can't be moved. Uh, the bomb disposal people are fairly certain it's booby-trapped underneath. Right. Uh, hand me that bag, Watson. Very well. I'll see what Moriarty's dreamed up this time. How's it going, Holmes? No trouble getting the casing off. Ah, and now I can see why. Another booby trap? I imagine so. There are two sets of wiring where only one is necessary. So one is real, and the other one will short-circuit and detonate if I cut it. Well, couldn't you... Couldn't you disconnect the timer or something? And not without disturbing the circuits. There's nothing for it but to cut one. No, sir. Don't worry, Watson. I told you wings don't suit me. Does Moriarty know that? That remains to be seen. Here we go, then. Dear, dear, dear. Those are the longest few seconds of my life, Holmes. <laughs> I'm sorry you were worried, Watson. But if I'd cut the wrong wire, it would at least have sold your quandary with Jane Mapleton. Oh, don't remind me. <laughs> but a Moriarty won't give up. No, but he's lost the benefit of surprise. We know he's alive and to some extent how he works. We can be rather more easily on our guard. You haven't arranged for someone else to call already, have you? No, nothing to do with me this time, Holmes. <sighs> if this goes on, I shall move. Oh, Mrs. Pettifer. <laughs> um, it's Mrs. Pettifer, Holmes. What? The lady whose Mr. car... Mr. Holmes, oh. I'm so oh. glad I found you in. Uh, I've had such a terrible time since we met. Uh, from George? Oh, good heavens, no, from my children. They were absolutely furious I didn't get your autographs. <laughs> and I thought... 
Well, in return for the loan of the car. Yeah, I, I'm sure we can bring about the return of domestic harmony, can't we, Watson? Oh, delighted. And I also thought perhaps you might like this. Plum jam. Homemade. How splendid. Oh. I thought you might not have too many home comforts being a bachelor household. It may not be for much longer. Oh, really? Congratulations, Mr. Holmes. Uh, not me, no. Matrimony is more in Dr. Watson's line. Oh, I'm so pleased for you. Oh, well, I'm, nothing's decided yet, I'm you sure understand. I'm sure she's a delightful girl. Oh, she is. But delightful. if she'd like any of my jam recipes, she's very welcome. Well, in fact, <laughs> perhaps you'd like to come down to Oakshop for tea one uh, afternoon. Well, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> That episode of Second Home starred Peter Egan as Holmes and Jeremy Nicholas as Watson, with John Dunn as himself. James McPherson was played by Simon Hewitt, Inspector Winter by David Goodison, Mrs. Pettifer by Lolly Cockerell. Second Homes was written by Grant Eustace and produced by Paul Mayhew Archer. (laughs) 